one and Ryan Brannigan. Now, here on Times Radio, let's cross to Edinburgh and the Times Radio SNP leadership debate with Asma Mir, who is now, as I can see, on the monitor, just away to my right there, gearing up. I can see the tension in the air. She's on stage there with all three candidates now, Asma. John, thank you very much. Welcome to the Times Scotland and Times Radio SNP debate live from Edinburgh with me, Asma Mir. And the question, of course, on everyone's lips is who will be Scotland's next First Minister? Voting closes at midday on Monday. That is less than six days away. And as it turns out, this is the last debate before the deadline. The candidates for the SNP leadership are fighting for the last remaining undecided voters, some of whom are with us in the audience tonight. So the three people competing for the job are with us in this room in Edinburgh tonight. We have Ash Regan, Kate Forbes and Hamza Youssef. Now, Times Radio's Aisha Hazarika, Kieran Andrews and John Boothman from The Times Scotland and Shona Craven from The National are here too. They're listening closely and they'll be joining me for analysis straight afterwards. And if you want to get involved, please do. You can email us. The address, you should know this by now, is studio at times.radio. Or you can comment on our YouTube page where you can watch the whole thing live or on Twitter the hashtag, it's going to be a hot one, it's hashtag times SNP. Right, let's get started. Now, the SNP is famous the world over because your party has had huge success. You've won every election since 2010 and under Nicola Sturgeon, you won eight elections in a row. But there are, of course, problems. Nothing is perfect. There are some serious issues that people are worried about. Now, in the news today, of course, you will know about life expectancy in the UK. We've learned today that 17 of the 20 constituencies with the lowest life expectancy, expectancy in the UK are in Scotland. This is according to research from Health Equals Campaign Group. Uh, now, Glasgow's seven constituencies take the seven bottom spots. Hamza Youssef, you've had a chance to fix this already. Why is Scotland in this position, do you think? So first and foremost, we have not clearly made the progress around healthy life expectancy that we would have wanted to as a government. Now, remember, of course, uh, part of the reason, if you listen to the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, if you listen to the Poverty Alliance, has been, of course, over a decade of austerity. But let me also say that we've got powers under devolution. And where we've made some progress, for example, when it comes to tackling inequalities, particularly inequalities in relation to areas of highest deprivation, have been when we've been bold and radical. So policies around minimum unit pricing, smoking cessation, uh, what the, the progress we've made in relation to uh, detecting cancer early. But if I am the leader of the SNP, if I am Scotland's next First Minister, every single government department, every single minister and every single cabinet secretary will be focused on not just poverty reduction, but where we can go further in terms of po uh, poverty uh, eradication. Because poverty is clearly at the, at the heart of all of this. And that's why the Scottish Child Payment, for example, has been described as transformative, as game-changing, because it will help us uh, deal with some of these issues. But we have to be upfront. Uh, there have been many successes of the SNP government, but clearly on healthy life expectancy, uh, we have not made the progress we would have liked. Kate Forbes, is it a matter of shame, embarrassment? Is this something that we accept, that 17 of the 20 constituencies with the lowest life expectancy in the UK are in Scotland? <laughs> So it's something that we cannot accept. But in order to move forward and resolve it, you need to diagnose what the root problems are and tackle the root causes of poverty in Scotland. And to bring this to the, the fore, these are individuals and the life expectancy between some of the most deprived and the least deprived areas in Scotland are over 24 years. So it's staggering. And we know that one in four children uh, are in poverty tonight. So. Diagnosing the root challenges is, is first and foremost important. It's a multi-generational issue. Uh, it leads to uh, inequalities when it comes to health outcomes um, and so on. My approach throughout this campaign has been to say that eradicating poverty has to be our overarching mission. It's an approach I took with multiple different budgets, that it can't just be left to one part of government to deal with poverty because it is an economic issue, it is a health issue, it is a justice issue, and we need to make sure that it's a whole government that comes together and resolves it. Two things that I would say in terms of uh, substantive policy changes that we need to make. Mm. 
The first is when it comes to creating well-paid, secure jobs and reaching into communities and ensuring that there are pathways out of poverty through well-paid, secure employment opportunities. Now, that's often uh, financially intensive for a reason, because it's about coming alongside families and individuals to support them. The second thing, though, is about ensuring that our public services are flexible and adaptable to meet families where they need them. I'll give you one example, if I can, I've, unless you want to, to come back to me. Uh yeah, well, go on. I'm trying to give it so as equal one, possible one, time one example you. is when it comes to a uh, health visitor service for uh, babies and children. Uh, that service needs to be adaptable, flexible, and ensure that it's providing that uh, support directly to families that need it to provide a different route and to support families. Um, Ash Regan, what have the government got wrong about um, fixing child poverty and also life expectancy? No, I mean, clearly we haven't made the progress on this that we would have wanted to. Um, but we have spent millions and millions and millions of pounds, this is well documented, obviously, mitigating the worst, as I would see it, of uh, Tory austerity, you know, from economic decisions that are made at Westminster clearly have an impact in Scotland. And uh, I, sh I would say that I think this shows the constraints of devolution, that we can do some things, but we can't, you know, we're not managing to solve some of these very tricky issues. Um, so I think for me, that's why independence can't wait. I just think that, you know, if Scotland was an independent country, we know it'd be something like the 15th richest country in the world. So it is not good enough, you know, that we know that children are going to bed hungry and cold in Scotland. So I think that, you know, if I'm First Minister, we'll obviously we'll do as much as we can d under devolution. And I think there are possibly some, you know, creative solutions and we need to target more onto some of these areas where we're not seeing the progress that we'd like to see. But I think we need to be working towards independence and we need to set out clearly to people where we think the difference would come with independence, how Scotland would be, you know, better off, it would be fairer, um, it would be greener, it'd be a nicer and better place for us all to live in. Uh, Kate Forbes, how much can we blame uh, the Conservative government, the Westminster government, for life expectancy rates in Scotland? A lot. We can, because uh, Hamza's already talked about the decade of austerity. You know, we've talked about the fact that eradicating child poverty has been a key aim of our budgets. But we've often been investing financially, purely in mitigating decisions that the UK government has taken. So, for example, we increased the Scottish Child Payment to £25, uh, whilst the UK government was cutting universal credit. So there ha there's quite clearly an approach here, which is us trying to eradicate child poverty, but with one hand tied behind our back. And of that, there is no doubt. Well, you all, you're all agreed on this, but who, um, Hamza, when you hear what Ash says needs to be done, are there indifferences about how you would address child poverty and life expectancy rates? I think there probably are some differences in terms of how we tackle it. Kate is, is, is correct, of course. I think we're all agreed that the impact of over a decade of Westminster austerity has clearly had an impact. It's not just from us, that's from uh, many of those in the third sector. You just have to look at the most recent budget where the UK government could have taken the decision to cut energy bills. Instead, they've taken a decision not to do that and people out there are going to suffer uh, and, and those in our, our areas of highest deprivation are going to suffer uh, the most. But that doesn't absolve us of the responsibility that we have. So I think we are at our best when we are bold, when we are radical. That's why I say uh, I'm in favour of progressive taxation and we may get to discussion uh, on that. No, let's, uh, but let's, I, let's discuss it now. But, but, but I, I believe that progressive taxation allows us to be able to invest uh, in our public services, allows us uh, the, 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 the income we need to, for example, increase the Scottish child payment, which has been described as transformative. Now, we've got to, of course, create jobs. We've got to increase the tax base. But progressive taxation, those limited powers that we have, we have to make sure we are using them to their absolute maximum we are being bold, we are being radical, we are being progressive when it comes to tackling some of the biggest okay. issues of the day. And there's no bigger issue than poverty and child. Well, on tax then, I mean, you want to bring in this uh, uh, additional tax ban between the highest and, and the second highest. said I would explore it. You said I would explore it. OK. Um, well, let's explore it now, shall we? Um, <laughs> if, if you were to bring that in, do you have an idea of how many people that would affect and how much it would raise? You 
So you I, must have. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, I basically, uh, and look, look at obviously the figures in more detail, but uh, it's based on the STUC report, which was uh, brought forward before uh, the last uh, budget. So I think they, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, it's a 44% tax rate between those who earn 75 to 125,000. Mm. So between the, the higher rate and the, and the top rate. Uh, and it bring in around about the 200 million uh, pounds uh, mark, uh, according to the STUC report. Uh, and for me, of course, that additional uh, revenue, that additional income could be put into a number of things. For me, uh, one of the areas I'm most attracted to is looking at how we compare social care, uh, adult social care workers more. Uh, we know that there is a big, big challenge in adult social care. I know that, of course, as Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care in particular. And of course, there cannot be an NHS recovery without a social care uh, recovery. And the biggest issue every single social care provider tells me is workforce, workforce, workforce. So yes, we can use it absolutely for uh, anti-poverty measures if we're progressive in our taxation, as we have done in the budget that John Swinney has set for 23-24. Uh, but we could also make sure that we are paying those who are some of the lowest paid for some of the, uh, you know, the jobs that we absolutely require in order for our NHS to recover. Um Ashley, I'll come to you in a second. Kate Forbes, uh, you're the current finance guru, genius, whatever. Wow, yeah. high praise. Exactly, absolutely. Well, th this very, it's a very loaded praise, though, because <laughs> I want you to tell me um, what you think of that idea. Would it work? Well, at the moment, you have to get serious about the income tax powers that we have. So we've only got power over rates and bans. And the aim of progressive taxation is to maximise the revenue that's available to reinvest in our public services. Uh, and at the moment, I support... Uh, fully the, the use of our taxpayers to be more progressive. But ultimately, the only way to increase the revenue that's going to public services and to guarantee it is to expand the tax base. Now, uh, the risk is if you overcomplicate income tax, which is, I think, the risk here, if you overcomplicate income tax, you could end up raising less, not more, because right now people are making conscious decisions about whether or not, for example, to uh, relocate to Scotland. And it's actually the important thing here is to expand the tax base because Scotland is far too dependent on far too few taxpayers. And when it comes to uh, getting that revenue that we need, you know, I am very supportive of the need to redistribute wealth. We absolutely have to do that. It's the only way to eradicate poverty. Mm -hmm. But you can't redistribute wealth unless you create it in the first place. So you have to create. It will. It's but not either or, you could do both. You could, of course. You're absolutely right. Because I, I agree with this point. Of course, you could create more jobs, uh, increase that tax base. Absolutely. But it's not a case that you can't use the powers that we have. Quite. Particularly Which for those who, who earn the most. So for those, again, I'm talking about people who are on a good salary, like you and I, for example, six-figure salary. In fact, paying more in order to invest in a so, public so sector. Sometimes you present I'm it as a kind of you can only do one or the other. You well, well do actually, both. it does become a choice. It does become a choice at some point. Well, it does if you're talking about trying to ensure that we deal with, for example, Scotland's population uh, challenges and attracting more people to live and work in Scotland. You know, it's well documented. Scottish Fiscal Commission, uh, most of the think tanks that are looking at the issue about economic prosperity and eradicating poverty all say that the challenge in Scotland is to expand the tax base. We need more people in work. To have more people in work, you need a tax uh, system that works. It can be progressive, it needs to be progressive, but ultimately it shouldn't be stymieing uh, the fact that we need to grow okay. a population. Can, 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 we, can we bring in Ash Regan? Under devolution at the moment, you know, with Brexit, we're not going to be able to get more people in work because obviously the free, free movement of people has now been ended, so we've got that challenge. And if we're coming back to the issue about, about poverty and so on, we know we've got lower rates of child poverty in Scotland, which is good, but obviously that's still too a low a bar. I think for all the candidates here, we'd want to do better than that. But if you look at the things that are reserved, we know that um, many of the children who are living in a household that's in poverty right now, one of their parents is in work, they're working. Mm -hmm. So that means that work isn't paying, but we don't have the powers over employment law. And we really need to restructure the economy so that we can focus on high paid jobs and we keep the supply chain in Scotland because that's how you know, people are able to work, earn enough so that they can do the things they need to do, feed and clothe their family, etc. We also know that under the UK, you know, Scots are paying the highest energy costs in the whole of the UK, despite the fact that we are generating a lot of the clean, green, renewable energy, and we're not getting the benefit from that. So that's a problem. And I also think that, you know, in terms of housing, we're clearly building a lot more housing. Housing costs are lower in Scotland, and that also helps. But I think... I wouldn't go to tax first. I think we already have a progressive tax system, so I wouldn't probably make those choices. I think we need to be looking at ways that we can create additional revenue. So if we can raise money in Scotland, um, not from people who are working, but from other sources, and, and one of the suggestions that I think we've, many of us have been talking about through this is to try to take a stake 
in the renewables industry so that that money is coming back to Scotland in a way that we didn't get from oil. You know, obviously we didn't get a sovereign wealth fund like they did in Norway. We cannot miss out on that again. And that money we could use in Scotland to do other things with it. OK, Kate Forbes. Well, I think, too, the point around tax is that you need to look at it in the round. You know, most tax experts will tell you that it's absolutely ridiculous to only have devolved income tax and bans. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense at all. Um, and therefore, we do need to be pressing for a greater devolution of, of tax powers, I think, to make more progress. But you also need to look at, at tax in the round. But the bottom line is, if you have, ultimately, more people paying tax then you have more public revenue. If you have more public revenue, you can deal with the issues that we're talking about, like eradicating poverty and reinvesting in our public services. So Scotland needs to be an attractive place to live and work, okay. and economic prosperity has got to be a, a goal. Okay. Very Again, very quickly. I, yeah, very quickly. I mean, I suppose the difference between myself and my two colleagues on my left is that I don't think it's a choice of either or. I think you can do both. But also, I think it's really, really important to say that in many public polls, it shows that people, particularly those who earn the most, uh, people agree with the position that people who earn the most should pay the most, which you can then invest in our public services. OK. Um, you are listening to the Times Scotland and Times Radio SNP debate with Asma Mayor. If you've got thoughts on what you've heard so far, remember you can email us on studio at times at dot radio or you can comment on our YouTube page or on Twitter using the hashtag Times SNP. We're going to bring in our first audience question, uh, which comes from uh, Jane Griffiths. Jane. Thank you. This is a question for the next First Minister, whoever that might be. I've, I'm not Scottish, as you can hear. I've relocated to Scotland and very happy to do so. What would the next First Minister do to heal the divisions in Scottish society? Ash Regan, please. Can I ask a follow-up? Divisions in what, what sense do you mean divisions? Can you explain? <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean w with regard, like the pro-independence and people who are not pro-independence? Is no, that what you're talking about? No. no. Much more broadly than that. Divisions in Scottish society. Hmm. And we haven't had that question so far. Um, Do you not believe there are any? Yeah, I'll take some time to think on okay, that one. Fine. So I fundamentally agree with you that I think we have lost the ability to disagree respectfully. It used to be, uh, you know, it used to be a time where you and I may have differing views on something, but we didn't dislike one another as a result of that. We were able to exchange views. And one of the points I've been at pains to make throughout my campaign is that the only path, for example, to one of my goals, which is independence, the only path to that is through persuading those who are not yet persuaded of the merits of independence. And the only way to persuade is to have an audience. The only way to have an audience is through respectful dialogue. The only way for respectful dialogue is if there is a respect of our, our mutual differences. And I think that's been lost across every single divide or disagreement that you might think. And amidst the clamour and the clash of a leadership contest, the, the central truth is this. There's far more that unites us in this room and across this panel than divides us. For example, we all want our children to have equal opportunities. We want to have an NHS that, that works. We want to have an economy that's growing. And I think that if we can get back to those points that we agree on and be willing to disagree respectfully, that is the first step. It starts with politicians. OK, Kate Forbes, those are warm words. But they can are. I, can I just read back what you said to Hamza? When you were Transport Minister, the trains were never on time. When you were Justice Minister, the police were strained to breaking point. And now as Health Minister, we have record high waiting times. What makes you think you can do a better job as First Minister? We're in a leadership contest. And but you said it starts with politicians. Absolutely, absolutely. But there's no, there's no personal attacks in those comments. We are talking in this contest. Did you contest. take it personally, Hamza Youssef? We are, we're talking about policy. I think the audience reaction probably tells you all you need to know. We're, we're <laughs> talking about policy. We're talking about policy. And what we care about, I think, in our first ministers is not just that they have good policy ideas, but they can deliver. And in a contest, I think it stands to reason that we will have robust, frank exchanges. But I tell you what, yeah. I respect Hamza and value what he has achieved and admire him hugely at whatever else is said in this contest. OK. Hamza Yusuf, what will you do to heal the divisions in Scottish society? So if I think you that become first minister? There's, there's no getting away from that. Uh, for me, a few things. First and foremost, too much of our political discourse is about those issues that can be described as the culture war issues. 
those wedge issues that divide us. Now, don't get me wrong, there are issues that, of course, every government, every first minister should rightly take a stand on. But I think the issues that are important to people are the cost of living crisis, are how we're going to recover our public services from the impact of COVID, is what we're going to do around the economy and the challenges that our economy face. And my priority as first minister and leader of the SNP, if I am entrusted by our membership, will be to roll up sleeves and get on with dealing with those issues from day one. But also, when you, are a, 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 when you have a new leader in place, that gives you the opportunity to set the tone from day one. And I would want to set a tone from day one. One of the first meetings actually I would like to have on day one is with all of those in the political opposition, the leaders in the political opposition, not just those that I have a close alignment with, i.e. the Greens, but actually all of those uh, leaders uh, to see where, where can we put our heads together? Where can we find common solutions in the national interest? I think if you do that as a leader, then it hopefully then, 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 then flows through, not just to the rest of parliamentarians, but I would hope it sets the tone for how we want to do public discourse in society more widely. Okay. So I think people take the tone of the leader, and I hope I've demonstrated this in the course of the last four weeks, where I've not indulged in those personal attacks, tried to keep positive about the vision uh, that I've got, that hopefully then I can demonstrate that's how I would act as First Minister too. Okay, um, Hamza, you had a big long list there of things that you think are important to the public, and nowhere on that was gender recognition or the safety of women. Are, should they be on that list? Yeah, of course. Because that's I've, been incredibly divisive. No, but of course they should, and, and it's really important that leaders also lead. So on the issue of GRR, I mean, we've passed the bill. Obviously, the issue will be about the Section 35 uh, order, and my stance on that is unequivocal in relation to challenging that. Uh, on, on, on the work on misogyny, I make no apology at all that I was the Justice Secretary that asked Baroness Helena Kennedy to take forward that work. So equally, yes, of course, these are issues that affect, uh, by the definition, when it comes to women, the majority of our society. They make up over 50% uh, of our society. So important we deal with those issues that affect uh, people in their everyday lives. That doesn't mean it has to be either or. I go back to that point. But what we have to do from day one is make sure that whoever the next First Minister is, whether you voted yes or whether you voted no, whether you vote at all, you have to be able to look at your First Minister and believe that they govern in the interests of all of Scotland. And that's something I would want to set the tone for from day one. OK, Ash Regan, you've had a bit of time to think about yeah. it. How would you fix... Heal. You know, it's very honest to say I want to take a bit of time to think about it. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. I just want to know now what you what would yeah, you do? I do think we are suffering a lot at the moment from cancel culture. And I think everyone understands what I mean by that. And I'm not a fan of that. I really, uh, you know, obviously as being someone that would probably be labelled as gender critical. And um, there were certainly a lot of women, particularly, but not just women, men as well, who, you know, over the last few years had found themselves, you know, being sacked from jobs, being um, no platforms, losing publishing contracts, being hounded out of their university jobs and so on, um, cancelled from Twitter, you know, all, the whole bit. And, you know, we can't have that. I think we, we have to be able to um, debate things um, on a quite a detailed level if we want to. Um, and even, and I think this is really important, even be able to cause offence. I think this idea that, you know, you can't offend people um, I don't think that's right. I think you have to be able to cause offence because you can't control what, others, what someone else is going to be offended by. However, I would say that for politicians, we do have a responsibility to have that appropriate level of debate, um, not make things personal or not reduce things down to you know, a level where... Um, you know, I'm thinking particularly, I think, of Brexit, you know, and some of the campaigning around Brexit, uh, particularly the sort of Farage-driven stuff. And I think we would all say that that led on to having quite a negative effect. We saw rise in hate crimes and so on against um, uh, immigrants and people from the EU. So that's obviously not appropriate. But certainly in terms of the GRR bill, I think it, it did create a lot of tension. We've obviously seen um, some protests, you know, outside Parliament and other places where they're, it's almost leading to kind of violent clashes, mm. which is obviously not what we want. We want everyone to be able to work together. And that's what I was saying as part of the GRR. We needed to listen to everyone. We needed to, um, particularly I felt in that process, we weren't listening, and the government wasn't listening to women enough or, and the organisations that were re representing women. And um, we have to do that. Okay. So if we do challenge the bill and we bring it back, I think there is going to be work there to do because there is a large se sector of society that are not happy with that legislation. They think it's flawed mm -hmm. and they think it actually puts them at risk. OK, we are going to talk about independence. We're going to talk about health in a minute. But let's, we, but let's just stick with gender now because, um, you know, we need to discuss it. I know that there's a, a couple of audience questions. Um, Hamza Yusuf, you've said that you go to court 
over the Westminster government's decision to block uh, the gender recognition um, bill. If the Scottish government's legal advice says that you cannot win, will you continue to pursue it? Well, obviously, we take legal advice in the round. You have to do that. You know, no government responsibly. Uh, if you get an equivocal, uh, unequivocal, sorry, answer from your your Lord Advocate that mm. says this cannot be won, uh, we do the responsible thing and, and, and wouldn't take that to court. But the start is about the starting principle. The starting principle, actually, actually for me, isn't about the substance of the GRR bill. I respect my colleagues on my left here who, who disagree with the GRR bill. Uh, I respect the fact in the audience there will be some people who agree with the GRR bill like me and there'll be some that disagree with it for me it's not about the principle uh, so, sorry it's not about the substance of the bill it's about the principle of Westminster being able to strike a, the red pen veto legislation that's been passed by the majority of parliament and passed uh, with the support of members from every single political party in the Scottish parliament so the starting position has to be that you don't cave into that if you cave into that then Westminster of course will come after the next piece of legislation and the next and the next and I don't believe as some have suggested that the right thing to do is to try to amend a bill that has already been passed by the majority of the Scottish Parliament simply to appease Westminster. I think what you do is you send a very strong message that we will not stand by while they veto legislation passed by the majority. Passed by the majority, but not supported by the majority of the Scottish public. Well, look, uh, uh, you, you and I are both minorities in this country. We've had to fight for our rights uh, from day one. Uh, that, in leadership terms, means that sometimes you have to try to take the public with you on the journey. Uh, you know, if it, came, if, it, if it comes to minority rights and we only ever went with the majority, I think you can speak to any minority who would be worried if that was the, that was the premise by which we uh, progress and advance but rights. Hamza, so not, absolutely not all, yeah, take but not, the but not all, Absolutely, you. but not all ethnic minorities necessarily will, will support your view will support the bill. That that's, be, not what, that's, not, that's not what I'm saying in the slightest. What I'm saying is that when it comes to issues of equality, yes, listening to public opinion, of course, is important, but demonstrating leadership. Why do you agree with something? Now, in the, in, in the case of the GRR bill, happy to get into the detail of it. Mm. For me, what we're looking at and why the parliament has passed that bill uh, is because we are making life that little bit easier for probably the most stigmatised and marginalised group in the country. That's something I'm happy to support. Okay. But in terms of the GRR bill in the section 35, let me say, actually, the substance of the bill is not necessarily the relevance here. The relevance is the principle of standing up against that Westminster veto. Uh, Kate Forbes, you were shaking your head there when, when Hamza Yusuf said that the Westminster, they'll, they'll block this and then they'll keep blocking and they'll keep blocking. Do you agree that that's what they would well, do? Well, I actually do agree that the Westminster government will continue to, to block uh, legislation. I think they have a, a mission to erode devolution. But the point when it comes to this legislation is that the legal advice really does matter. So I'm not spoiling for a fight just for the sake of it. I will always stand up for Scotland. It's what I've done as Finance Secretary. It's what I would do as First Minister. But I also think that as a government and a party that wants to be uh, independent, we need to be able to solve our problems ourselves. So we need to be able to find a way through this so what ourselves. So what would that way be? Well, I actually support reform of the Gender Recognition Act. Uh, I do think that the current uh, gender recognition um, uh, approach is far too onerous and it does stigmatise the trans community. And I think that we do need to make it less onerous. But we also need to take women and girls with us. So we need to ensure that we have the confidence of women and girls when it comes to single-sex spaces and don't uh, stigmatise the trans community further. And I think that once I've sought legal advice on the way forward, we can in Parliament, and I think it should be in Parliament because we're absolutely sent there as elected representatives to solve problems, we can find a way forward that perhaps, going back to the earlier question, has a bit more respect at the heart of the dialogue than we've seen so far. OK, we've got... OK, very quickly, because we've got to go to an audience No, I, I appreciate that. I suppose there's two questions that I've got. One is the reverse of the question that Asma asked me, which is, if the legal advice says that we have a case, mm -hmm. then is yes. your principle to absolutely take that to the court? So that's the first. And the second one is, you want to bring forward an amendment to the bill, but remember, this is a bill that's been passed by the majority Absolutely. of Parliament. So, so the only motivation then, surely, to, no, no, no. to, to do that so would be because Westminster are threatening to veto it. No, no, no. So we're, in, we're in a position. So if this bill had passed through Parliament and had been, Parliament. Pa yeah. if it had passed through Parliament and there had been no veto, then it would become law. And, and the point that I've made is that we're in a position because of the, the Section 35 where we need to have an answer to resolving it. And we can either go to court against legal advice well, and spending money could that could be used elsewhere in a cost of living crisis, 
or we can take that legal advice and make a decision on the back of that. If there is no alternative to court, I'll go to court. But I think there is an alternative to court, and that's the point I'm making. So when it comes to the, the amendments, my point here is, if we are a party that wants to be independent, a government that wants to be independent, we need to be able to resolve our own challenges ourselves. Uh, okay. if, we were in, if we were independent, we would not have a foreign government, for example, okay. coming in and vetoing our legislation. Okay, Hamza, the point is, of okay. course, that you've, we, of course, we have that veto. Yeah, you've, you've made that point. Let, let's speak, so let's I won't Mashri be going to court because I think the legal analysis will tell us that we will lose that court case. And I don't think that shows us standing up to devolution, I think that, or standing up to the UK government. I think that is something that you want to do um, for things where you have the public behind you. And I think it's very clear that on this issue, uh, the parliament, so I would say the government and also the parliament was out of step with the public's view on this. And, you know, Hamza has raised, you know, equalities and that we should always be protecting everyone's rights. And we should be. That's absolutely right. However, we do everyone a disservice when we don't mention the fact that rights often come into conflict. And that's the part of this that we didn't quite get right. So, and, and people like Hamza and my other colleagues, they need to explain why they voted against some safeguarding amendments that were put forward by myself and others. So I um, was part of a group of people who submitted amendments we felt that would increase safeguarding. Uh, and vote, I voted for everything that I thought would increase safeguarding. Um, not many of them were successful. I think I was the only person that got an amendment through that was not supported by the government. And I also think there's an argument here, potentially, um, and if I, I'm going by what pe the members of the public have told me about their dismay, really, with watching this piece of legislation pass through the parliament at all the different stages, and they felt that at every turn, you know, they were being shut out and their voices weren't being heard. They weren't able to get in front of the decision makers. No one was listening to what they were saying. And I wonder if there's a case now, having watched that process, uh, for strengthening the committee system or changing some of the ways we do things so that we don't get into this position again where we've ended up passing a law okay. that you know, the public do not support. OK, um, Hamza, you said on the subject of amendments, you know, I mean, is it fair to say that no law is perfect? Do you regret not voting for amendments that would put rapists in women's prisons? Uh, no, I don't, because there was a substantial <laughs> discussion, of course, on that amendment. What we have done is updated... You haven't had to pass an amendment. We've updated the SPS policy, which says that, of course, if a, a man with a history of violence towards a woman shouldn't be in a female prison. Now, of course, in the Isla Bryson case, it that happened. was a mistake. Well, yeah. of course it was a mistake. Yeah. Of course it was a mistake. And, of course, it has nothing to do with GRR, because GRR is not in force. <laughs> Uh, no, you can shout. Okay. You can it's, shout all you want. But the bill, I'm afraid, okay, okay. I'm afraid it's the bill a policy okay. based okay. on self ID. Okay. The, okay. the bill is not even in force. So anybody to shout and suggest that but has to do with GRR. Organisations in Scotland I'm okay. afraid, let's, let's are running let's ahead Hamza, of the law. Okay, let's let Hamza finish. It's simply not correct. So yeah. I agree that uh, the policy from SPS should have been uh, the policy that is now the updated one, and that um, uh, any man with a history of violence should not be in the female estate. Um, OK, can we get a question now from uh, Maggie Mellon, please? Hi, hello, good evening. Um, yeah, my question, it is about this subject, but it's about schools and what children are taught in school. And I want to ask all the candidates whether they think it's right that children in Scottish schools are taught as a fact in our curriculum that children, that they have such a thing as a gender identity that might be different to their sex, that their sex is only assigned at birth, that their parents and the doctors might all be wrong about that and that they can then change their gender. This is what's part of the Scottish curriculum. Do you agree with that? Okay, Kate Forbes. So I would um, express considerable concern with an approach that removes parents from the conversation. And I think um, having just a purely affirmative approach is a problem for our young people. So I have recently had a baby and in the 20 week scan, they told me it was a little girl. Um, they, it, they discovered the fact that it was a, a little girl. It wasn't, it wasn't assigned, it was a, a little girl. And uh, we need to ensure that parents are part of the conversation with our young people uh, throughout their education. And I have expressed concerns in the past when parents are removed from that conversation. And uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's critical that there aren't conversations going on in a way that don't seek the parents' consent. OK. Hamza Youssef, would you be comfortable with your... You've got two daughters, haven't you? I do, indeed. Yeah. Would you be comfortable with them being told that kind of stuff? 
I would, of course, be comfortable with them being taught about gender identity, being taught about the fact that some people are non-binary, that some people transition. Of course, I would be comfortable uh, with that. I, I don't disagree uh, largely with Kate around parents' involvement, but also I, during the course of the GRR bill, um, and, and, and this has been going on for a number of years, as you know, one of the first conversations I had was with a young Muslim who was trans, and he had told me, and uh, very clearly, that if his parents had known that he was transitioning, then the reprisals would have been pretty difficult to, to have dealt with. And, 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 and he didn't feel he could, at that point, certainly as a young man come out, uh, uh, as, as somebody who was transitioning. Um, so we have to just be careful that if there is, for example, a 15-year-old who is considering transitioning, of course I would want that 15-year-old to be comfortable enough to be able to talk to the parents, but that's not the reality for every single person. That is not the reality for every single 15, 16 year old. Uh, and so we've got to make sure that our schools are also that safe space uh, for young people to absolutely be able to express themselves. But I largely agree. I mean, I, the relationship I have with my uh, daughter and stepdaughter at 13 years old is uh, pretty open. <laughs> and and she'll, she'll talk to me about uh, many things uh, in her life uh, that are going on. Uh, but that is not the case for everybody. OK, OK. Ash Regan, what, what, could you, how do you answer the question? Yeah, I do have concerns about that. And so if I was First Minister, that's something that I would look into and obviously get everyone in to have a conversation about exactly what we should be doing on that. I, I'm also concerned about parents not being involved in this type of situation. I had a parent that came to me who was a constituent um, and she said that the school were, had socially transitioned her daughter, who I think was 13 or 14 at the time, but they hadn't told the parents. So the parents had no idea what was going on and they were, they were very upset that this decision had been taken without their involvement at all in this process. So I think we've got to make sure that we do involve parents in this. Um, and I also think there's a fundamental issue here that you know, we need to teach children to love themselves. We need to teach them to love their bodies. I don't think um, much good can come of, of teaching kids to loathe themselves or to think that something might be wrong with them. I just fundamentally disagree with that. Kate, you look like you want to well, say something. Just, it, I mean, this is a, a really sensitive matter that I think families across Scotland are grappling with right now. If I take, for example, on a local level as a constituency MSP, this is an issue that parents are raising with me on, on quite a regular basis where they are worried about what their children are being taught, not having sort of heard or, or received any guidance from the school on what is being taught and children are coming home raising very profound questions about their identity at a very young age, sometimes as young as four or five or six. And, you know, working with those parents, I've certainly been trying to raise this with the local authority who say it comes from the Scottish Government, working with the Scottish Government who say it's a local authority. And I think this is the, the central point that, you know, there has to be involvement of parents and parents need to know what their young people are being I exposed okay. to um, so that they can also guide their young children uh, when it comes to these extraordinarily sensitive matters. Okay, I want to move off this subject now, um, but before we do, just a final question on this, on this subject. Um, do you agree with JK Rowling that Nicola Sturgeon was a destroyer of women's rights? Kate Forbes. Um, I have a lot of respect for both of the women that you have just re referenced in that that question. And um, I think J.K. Rowling is incredibly brave and I think Nicola Sturgeon has done a lot for women and girls and has been an exceptional mentor when it comes to women and girls. And the sort of, the way that you've asked that question I think goes to the heart of the problems that we're grappling with right now, that we have a binary question which means you have to take a side. And for me, I think that J.K. Rowling has been subject to far too much abuse for raising very legitimate concerns. Um, and I think you can also think that Nicola Sturgeon has been pioneering when it comes to, to women and girls. OK, Hamza Youssef. I'll give you a pretty binary answer. No, I don't think Nicola Sturgeon is a destroyer of women's rights at all. Quite the opposite. I think she has spent most of her career, her political career, trying to advance the rights of women. To anybody suggest that she's been a destroyer of women's rights, I'm afraid, is something I just take exception to. So that's JK Rowling, then, that you take exception Indeed. to? Okay. Um, Ash Regan. I think uh, JK Rowling has been very brave in the way that she's um, 
you know, advocated for this issue at a time, like we were talking about earlier, at a time a few years ago when hardly anyone dared to speak up on this issue because they were fearing for their livelihoods. You know, it was uh, such a toxic debate that you couldn't say anything. I think it's changed a little bit in the last couple of years. So I think she was very brave to do that. And I think people speaking out gave other people confidence to speak out. So I think that was important. Um, I wouldn't phrase it in the way that she has, but I did have serious concerns about the impact that that piece of legislation would have on um, women's single sex basis and exemptions and the ability to uphold them in law and the conflict with the Equality Act. Mm -hmm. And I felt that women, you know, ha felt that they were going to be less safe, protected and have less dignity as a result of that. And obviously I ultimately resigned from the government over this issue because I felt I could not vote in good conscience for that piece of legislation. Uh, can we now talk about... Can we now talk about um, the SNP uh, membership problems? Uh, 30,000 or so um, SNP members have, have left the party. Why do you think they have left the party, Kate Forbes? Because we focused on issues that divide rather than unite, and also because members have not been not felt as empowered as they should have felt. We've just spent the last 30 minutes, I think, talking about uh, an issue that divides this room, that divides this panel, and that has divided our party. And I can only go on the basis of anecdotal conversations with members locally that have left. Now, bear in mind, 72,000 people have stayed and so when it comes to uh, the 30,000 that have left, I think it's because they're largely in the SNP because they want to see us focus on independence and deliver independence. That is the raison d'etre of uh, the SNP ultimately. And they feel like they haven't had uh, a, a sort of stake in our pursuit of independence and they wanted their voices to be heard. OK, Ash Regan, why have they left? Yeah, so this was something that I didn't, you know, tried to investigate with the party and I'd had a couple of conversations with people that worked in HQ before the leadership contest started, asking them, you know, have we lost members? Because my mailbag was suggesting that we had. I'd had a lot of people write to me um, starting in October last year um, when I resigned and carrying on really until now. Um, saying that they'd left the party. So I would have put it down to two things. Um, one was lack of progress on um, moving towards independence or lack of a plan towards independence. And the other one was GRR. So I did suspect we'd lost quite a number of members, although it's difficult to extrapolate that um, based on you know, emails that you've had. Um, now, we can't be sure exactly why the members have left. I think the SNP do keep some um, records to have a suggestion of why people have left. But I think if we look at the fact that we've lost 31,000 from um, August last year until this time this year, that certainly encapsulates the period when the GRR was going through Parliament. And so I would say it's likely, although I can't be 100% sure, but it's likely that many of them have left for that reason. Now, we still, it's still a large membership. You know, 72,000 still puts us way ahead of any other political party. I think the issue for me is not what the membership number is, but if 30,000 people have left, you know, in the last six months, mm -hmm. as a party and the leadership of the party, we need to be thinking about why have those people left and are we doing something wrong that has led to, you know, quite a large exodus of members? And if so, we need to be putting that right. Mm -hmm. Hamza Youssef, do you agree with the reasons that might be behind people leaving and what, if you are First Minister, what can you do about it? I suspect my colleagues are, are, are right. There's a, a myriad of factors, but uh, you know, for our progressive agenda, there's no doubt that we've also gained a lot of members, particularly a lot of young members uh, over uh, the years. But I suspect my colleagues are right. Uh, there, there are multiple issues. And I suspect the fact that we've been talking about process a lot as opposed to policy when it comes to independence. Mm -hmm. People don't really get inspired by talks of de facto referendums in Section 30. They tend to get inspired uh, by a vision that you've got in terms of eradicating poverty and so on and so forth. So I think we've got to get back onto talking about the policy uh, issues. Uh, look, the, the membership number uh, issue, if I can call it that, over the last you know, 72 hours. It is an issue, though, isn't it? Of course it is. I yeah. said, as I can call it okay. that. I mean, that was a mild and polite right. word for it. Okay. Um, what, what's, it's, what's the correct word? <laughs> I'm always polite, as my mother would tell you. Um, <laughs> I, I would say that it's been a total own goal. Um, we should not have got ourselves into this position, and frankly, we should have released the membership numbers from day one when this contest started. Why, why weren't they, do you think? I know you don't know, but why, know. Do you, why do you think they weren't? I genuinely don't know. And, and Is it embarrassing? It well, embarrassing to be the largest party in Scotland? No. A drop of 30,000 members, of course, nobody wants that. But we are by far the biggest party by quite some distance okay. uh, in Scotland. OK, you were listening to the Times Scotland and Times Radio SNP debate. We're going to move on next to talk probably about independence. Uh, we're probably going to be talking more about process rather than policy, uh, Hamza Youssef, I'm afraid. But that's where, <laughs> that is where um, uh, you know, some, of you, some of you differ. Um, now, we know what Rishi Sunak's position is on independence. 
If Keir Starmer is uh, the next Prime Minister of the UK, he said that he won't do a deal with the SNP, he won't have another, ref another referendum, the government's ruled out too. So what are you, all three of you, going to do about getting independence? Kate Forbes. So the only path to independence is through persuading a sustained majority of people in Scotland to support independence. And for my, you know, this is where I actually agree with Hamza, that talk about process never persuaded anyone. Talk about vision does. So I know there will be people in the room tonight who haven't yet been persuaded uh, on independence. And our job is to work with them, understand respectfully the reasons why they haven't supported independence yet, and see if we can... Uh, find a, a vision that is compelling when it comes to independence. Now, I completely back the vision for independence. I think that we can be wealthier and fairer as an independent nation. But so did Nicola Sturgeon not do that? Well, I don't think the groundwork has been done sufficiently on that case for independence. Not that the case isn't there, but because we haven't been uh, persuading, we haven't been working in a respectful fashion with those who aren't yet persuaded to persuade them. But you know, the other two points I would make is that the root of all of this is trust. And good governance is important for the sake of our NHS, for the sake of our people. But it's also political. Govern well and you earn the right to try and persuade people. And the second thing I would say is around trust. Earning the confidence and the trust of the Scottish people is also important when it comes to making the case for independence. OK, I'll come back to the, you, uh, the other two of you in a, in a second on your kind of vision for independence and, and what you can do to get it up from 45%. But Kate Forbes, I think I'm right in saying you're the only candidate who said that you wouldn't demand a referendum in return for propping up um, a minority Labour government. So... If you were First Minister and if you were to prop up a minority Labour government, what would you ask for in return? I would ask for a devolution of constitutional affairs as one ask. There's a few other things I'd quite like as well, and not least uh, control over immigration. But that would be uh, a priority. You know, I think it's for the people of Scotland to determine when they want to become an independent country. And it is a block to democracy to see that denied. But that doesn't take away from my central point, which is there's no path to independence without persuading no voters to vote yes. Mm. So whatever the polling is saying, I think many of us are disappointed that there hasn't been more of a sustained movement in support of independence, considering what we've been dealing with, considering the, the, the conservative attacks on devolution, considering the fact that we're in a Tory cost of living crisis and so on and so forth. Yeah. So we need to reset that we need to get back to that respectful dialogue and understand why people haven't yet been persuaded. OK. Um, Hamza Youssef, 45% um, uh, support for um, independence now and, you know, back in 2014. Things have moved, but we're, we're kind of back where, where we started. Is that, is that a disappointment to you? Yeah, it is a, a disappointment. A personal disappointment? Yeah, it's a personal disappointment. Uh, to me, of course it is. Uh, we just don't have that consistent, sustained majority for independence. One poll puts us at 52%. A poll will come out literally a few hours later, putting us at 48 or 45%. Uh, percent. That's clearly not a consistent, sustained majority. And the only route to independence is getting that settled well, that majority support that is consistent. And uh, I agree a lot with what, 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 what Kate has said. There's probably not much difference between us in relation to, to the view of how we get independence. It is by that consistent majority. Now, we have spent a lot of time pointing out Westminster's failures. We're right to do so because they are many. But that clearly hasn't shifted the dial enough in, in terms of independence. Mm -hmm. What we have to do, because people don't get inspired by talks of process, is talk about the vision for independence. Why do we want independence? We want it to not reduce poverty, but eradicate but it. But you have been we doing want, that, haven't you? I, I, you have well, been talking no, I, about that I, I for think, years. I, I think what we've been doing, I'm afraid, far too often, most recently, is getting stuck in the quagmire of process. You get stuck in the quagmire of process, people don't get inspired for independence. And we have to also kickstart, and I certainly do this as leader of the SNP, is kickstart that people-led civic movement. That was the beauty of mm -hmm. 2014, was all of that, all of those groups that were grassroots, organic, making the case for independence. So we have to get back to inspiring people. If we do that, we'll get that consistent majority. And frankly, that's how we ended up getting that Scottish Parliament just uh, down the road from here. We had that settled well, I think, as Donald Dewar uh, often described it. If you get that, then the political obstacles put in the way by Westminster will inevitably disappear. But we have to build that consistent majority. OK, Ash Regan, how would you boost support for independence up from 45%? Yeah, so r roughly I would say it's about 50%. So sometimes it's over that, sometimes it's under. And obviously it's a lot... Um, different than it was when we started off in 2014 where it was about 27% so clearly we're in that that area now 
And I don't agree with the, my two colleagues here that if we just get a sustained majority that automatically Westminster will just give us a referendum. Um, so my plan on this, and I am the only person that set out a plan on this, is that the First Minister focuses on the priorities of the people of Scotland. We stop talking about referendums and we stop making that something that we talk about a lot in Parliament and instead we get back to governing wisely, cross-party for the things that matter. Then um, we restart or we start up an independence convention. So that sits out in civil society and that would be the other pro-independence parties, civil society and so on. And they design the Yes campaign and run that. So again, that's separate from the First Minister, separate from government. But I'm also suggesting that we set up an independence commission. So this would be a body that would be tasked with doing all the infrastructure and the planning in order to get Scotland ready to become an independent country. And then my plan for independence is that you know, we know why Westminster is not allowing Scotland to have a referendum. I mean, that's, you know, they're entitled to do that. But the reason they're not allowing us to do it is because they don't want to know what Scotland thinks about the union. They don't want Scotland to be able to express its will on this topic. And so what I'm suggesting is that that's not acceptable. You know, um, the UK cannot hold Scotland and the people of Scotland hostage in the mm. UK when we're always being told this is a voluntary union. And so I'm suggesting that the referendum isn't the gold standard, the ballot box is actually the gold standard, and that we use the ballot box that's available to us, which would be each and every election. So we ask the people of Scotland, we just have it um, in, in the background. We don't talk about process ever again. We just make the case for independence. We get on with governing and we let the people of Scotland decide when it's time. OK, Kate Forbes, what do you think of that idea? Well, I think that I go back to perhaps sounding like a broken record. There's no path to independence. Indeed, there's no path to being a successful independent country without persuading people. Now, I would, you know, an independent country will have people of all different backgrounds, different political views in it making decisions. And I think that we have got to reach out to those, not just who aren't supporting us on, on, on independence, but those who aren't supporting the party right now. Because ultimately the goal of, of independence is self-determination. It is the idea that those who are best placed to make decisions are those who are affected. Now you can make that argument on, for example, energy right now, where energy policy is determined by those that are very far removed from being affected uh, here in Scotland, in a country that is rich with energy. We can make that case, whether it's um, you know the elderly or the young, whether it's people that vote Labour or vote Conservative, you can make that case, but it okay. starts with that respectful dialogue. Okay, is it, uh, the next... The next section, I just want to clear up a couple of things that are floating around. You know, this is the last debate before voting closes. So this is your opportunity, all of you. Um, Ash Regan, um, some people say that you are um, Alex Salmond's preferred candidate. You are basically, you are Alex Salmond in disguise. <laughs> it's, is it not a very had, good disguise, though? It's a pretty good disguise. <laughs> Have you had any conversations or contact with Alex Salmond or his team during this contest? Yes. So I, I said, I was quite clear about that. I think it was a couple of weeks ago now um, that I, I called, although I will clarify, I didn't get this quite right last time I said it, um, but not everyone called me back, but I called all the pro-independence leaders um, of other political parties, and I've also spoken to a number of the civil society leaders of the wider independence movement as an attempt to kind of get everyone on board with the convention idea and just to reach out to them, speak to them, and just to see, um, test the level of support for that. So yes, I did speak to him as part of that. Do you think he supports you? Um, he wished me well. He said the independence convention was a good idea. Um, I've seen a couple of clips of him in the media saying that my independence plan is the best of the three candidates. I don't know him very well. I've only ever served under Nicola Sturgeon as a first minister. So I really don't know him very well at all. Okay. Um, Kate Forbes, the uh, SNP MP John Nicholson today called you a religious fundamentalist and said you are obsessed with sex. <laughs> what would you like to say to John Nicholson? Well, I would say that that is quite a remarkable <laughs> accusation to make and I don't know that I have much to say in response to that kind of uh, accusation you know we're uh, uh, you know I've answered more questions on faith than anybody else has probably answered in their lifetime and I think that you know that the, <laughs> the Yusuf's not so sure well I, I, well, I, I think probably in this, this contest <laughs> it's pretty clear you know I have said unequivocally that I'm here to serve all of Scotland 
I have served all of Scotland. My track record speaks for itself in terms of serving all of Scotland. And as you said, this is the last hustings. We have just a matter of days until voting closes. I think SNP members have a, a real diversity of candidates in front of them. Uh, and my pitch has been from the beginning that continuity won't cut it. We need change. We need competent delivery. Um, and we need to reach out to no voters. And that is the pitch that I've offered. And we await to see what SNP members will say at the ballot box. OK. Um, Hamza Youssef, um, you said to Ash Regan you've never held a cabinet position was that a bit mean? Would you like to apologise for that? I don't think it was mean. It was just a statement of, of, of fact. And, you, of course, we need somebody in the job as First Minister who has considerable experience in, in government. And uh, I think Cabinet experience, having been a junior minister myself, having also been through Cabinet and been in Cabinet for many, many years, um, I, I, I think that experience counts uh, for a lot. Uh, but I, I hope Ash wasn't upset, uh, offended or upset Ash, uh, you by offended that. Or, were you offended or upset? Well, it is a statement of fact. However, I would say that I don't think that you necessarily have to be in the Cabinet in order to be a good First Minister. No, I mean, if you were in another political party and you, you won an election spontaneously, people who'd never been in government, never maybe you know, had, had any roles like that would be straight to the top. It's about values. It's about whether you can listen whether you can build a top team, whether you can focus on the priorities that the public have, whether you've got a plan for some of the challenges that we've got ahead of us, and whether you think you can lead. And I think leadership is about inspiring people and bringing people together, and I think I have those qualities. Okay, Kate Forbes, what would, would, would you have uh, Hamza Youssef as your um, health secretary if you were to become I president? would have him in government, and I would be happy to <laughs> That's still a no, then. all <laughs> options with him. <laughs> in terms of, it might be more a question as to whether he'd want to continue continue in health or not, because it's a pretty gruelling gig. It is the hardest job in government by a country mile. Would you want to continue? Now, look, I'll, I'll serve uh, whenever I'm asked, uh, of course, uh, to serve. But in the seriousness, because we are, you're right, this is the last yes. uh, debate. And, and I really want to pay tribute to my colleagues. And it's been a gruelling uh, yeah. contest. I think Kate, in particular, with our young baby, exceptional traveling, traveling across uh, the country to, what, 15, 16 hustings. Um, and, and look, party contests are by the very nature uh, divisive. They can be bruising. Mm -hmm. They can be pretty uh, robust, um, but I've got no doubt at all in my mind that whoever is the next leader of our party, the three of us, uh, whoever, uh, whoever wins, we will all unite behind that leader, get right behind them, because the one thing that absolutely unites the three of us is wanting to deliver independence for Scotland. OK, well, uh, we're coming to the end. We've got about five minutes or so, four minutes, actually, of this debate. But I really want to ask you a question about the coronation. If you are First no. Minister, what will you be doing on Coronation Day, May the 6th? Ash Regan. So I've already committed to lead an independence march on the 6th. So, because um, obviously I haven't yet been invited to the, to the coronation. But if I become First Minister, yeah. um, I will send a representative of Scotland okay. to represent us. Uh, Kate Forbes? Um, well, I too have responded in like fashion, but um, obviously uh, I think it's important that we do have a representative at the coronation. Um, and I'd be exploring whether I can do both in one day. Oh. OK, goodness me, right. Uh, yes, uh, Hamza Youssef. I suppose it goes back to Jane's question. It was Jane, wasn't it, uh, that asked the question about uh, respect. And the First Minister has a duty to represent all of Scotland, those who vote no, those who vote yes, yeah. those who believe in the monarchy, those that don't. Uh, and therefore, I would be at the coronation because I think it's right for the First Minister uh, to lead by example, to show that actually, regardless of my, my own personal views, I've been pretty open about the fact that I'm a Republican uh, and I've never hidden that fact. Uh, my job is to represent everybody in the country and one of the duties as First Minister would be to attend the coronation. Can each three of you, um, in as short a sentence as possible, tell us something personal about you that we do not know? <laughs> uh, Hamza Youssef, I'm going to start with you. Um, I have never had a deep-fried Mars bar. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to say, that's probably lost me. Oh my goodness, that's probably lost me. A whole Na ton of folks. Neither have I, but I have seen one. Um, <laughs> Kate Forbes. I think you may know this already, oh. but I don't know. I could drive a motorbike long before I could drive a car. I d well, I, didn't I had a motorbike that. license long before I had a mo car license. Okay. Ash Regan. I can sing. I used to sing in a band when I was at university. Oh, that's huge. <laughs> no. I just feel I just feel that's not a good idea. No. I just, you know, that's that's not fair. Um, one other thing before we get to the very kind of closing uh, statements. Can you tell us who you admire at Westminster but you cannot include anyone from the SNP? Kate Forbes. Oh, man, come to me first, eh? Um, well, uh, I have had to work during COVID with some chief secretaries to the Treasury mm -hmm. and Simon Clark, 
and I worked together in a way that actually got problems solved. Okay. So I like someone who solves a problem. Hamza Yusuf. So is there people, um, one is Jeremy, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, one is Jess Phillips. I think she's done an incredible job uh, raising a number of issues, but particularly around misogyny. And the person, unfortunately, that's no longer with us, who I worked with in government, who I respected and admired a lot, was James Brokenshire. I dealt with him when he was security minister and I was justice secretary. Just somebody who was so committed to the national interest, and, and I, I actually uh, deeply miss uh, the interaction I had with him when I was justice secretary. Okay, Ash Regan. I've never met her, but um, I think that Harriet Harman's done a lot for women since she's been elected, so I think I'd say her. Right, we're coming to the end of of, uh, this section of the programme now. Um, This is your opportunity to tell people listening who might be SNP uh, members, uh, people in the room who are undecided, why you should be First Minister of Scotland, why you should be the the leader of the SNP. Ash Regan. Well, I think we need uh, someone who can, as First First Minister, focus on the priorities that the Scottish people have. So that would be things like the NHS and the cost of living crisis. I think we need someone that can listen, that can have a big tent, um, you know, a wide open door, a long table, but no comfy chairs. I think that's important. Um, I think we need someone strong at the moment, someone who has shown that they're not afraid to stand up for what they believe in. And I think at this point, we need someone that can stand up for Scotland and can stand against Westminster and someone that has a plan for independence because I believe that's the best route to a Scotland that we all want to live in. Okay, Hamza Youssef, why should you be First Minister? I want to be First Minister and leader of the SNP quite simply because I believe I can build a team that will deliver us independence for Scotland. I also believe I'm the only candidate here that will protect our pro-independence majority in Parliament, that will stand up to Westminster power grabs, but most importantly, will speak to the people in Scotland, regardless of whether they vote for the SNP, regardless of whether, whether they vote yes or whether they vote no. And the way we do that is by governing well and governing in terms of their priorities, which include, of course, investment in our public services, a well-being economy, and also tackling the cost of living crisis. Okay, Kate Forbes. Well, I think this is a really important moment for our party, but it's an even more important moment perhaps for the country. And as I said already, I think there's a lot more that unites us in this room than divides us. The three... Uh, attributes that I bring to the table that are required to be First Minister is first of all a focus on honesty and candour in our governance at the heart of the SNP but also in the Scottish Government as well. Being clear about what's working but also clear about what's not working. Secondly having the competence to fix it. So actually to deliver on our very excellent policies and deliver results. And lastly and perhaps most importantly is the only route to independence is by persuading no voters. And I have been approaching this with a mission to reach across the divide and perhaps settle the argument in favour of yes by bringing that respectful dialogue to the fore. Okay. Hamza Youssef, Kate Forbes and Ash Regan, thank you all for joining us for the Times Scotland and Times Radio SNP debate. I think that we all appreciate that it ha- they've, you know, they've done a huge amount of, of you know, talking, they've, they've travelled, they've, they've answered all the questions, some of the questions have you know, been asked many, many times before, and I think they all do deserve a huge round of applause. Thank you so much. We will, of course, bring you the results live on Times Radio when it comes on Monday afternoon. We'll let the candidates go and get some sleep, but stay with us as Aisha Hazarika, John Boothman, Kieran Andrews and Shona Craven are with us. They've been taking careful notes and we'll see who they think came out on top. And we'll find out what the audience here in Edinburgh made all of that. But first on Times Radio, let's get the news with Eleanor Sherwood. Asma. Asma, thank you. Good evening. The final debate between the three candidates vying to be the next leader of the Scottish National Party has just taken place on Times Radio. The debate between Kate Forbes, Hunza Yousaf and Ash Regan came just hours after Nicola Sturgeon chaired her final cabinet meeting as First Minister. Key points of contention included tax and the gender recognition reform bill. When asked by host Asma Mir about the fact the SNP's lost around 30,000 party members since 2021, Health Secretary Hamza Youssef admitted the party could have done things differently. The membership number uh, issue, if I can call it that, over the last you know, 72 hours... It is an issue though, isn't it? Of course it is, I yeah. said, as I can call it okay. that. I mean, that was a mild and polite right. for it. Okay. I, I would say that it's been a total own goal. Um, we should not have got ourselves into this position and frankly we should have released the membership numbers from day one when this contest started. 
Boris Johnson says he's very much looking forward to his appearance before the Privileges Committee tomorrow. He'll face questioning over whether he misled Parliament over the Partygate scandal. The former Prime Minister says the evidence conclusively shows he didn't. Earlier today, his written defence was published. In it, he denied joking that he was probably at the most unsocially distanced gathering in the UK right now during a mid-pandemic leaving do. Times Radio's chief political commentator is Lucy Fisher. In a way, this dossier with very legalistic uh, language might be treated by some uh, as an attempt at obfuscation. I think when you step back uh, and, uh, and and look at the uh, events, uh, you know, Boris Johnson not denying that he made that joke about social distancing um, uh, guidance being breached, it does stretch credulity, I think, uh, in, in the minds of many. Taking hormonal contraception increases the risk of breast cancer by 25%. That's according to research from Oxford University, which looked at tens of thousands of women. It's the first to establish such a link. It shows the newer progestogen-only pill, which makes up half of prescriptions, carries the same risk of breast cancer as the traditional combined pill. Other forms were also found to increase it. However, experts say the overall risk of breast cancer in young women is very low and appears to decline when women stop using contraception. A former chief constable has told Times Radio that it's important to have confidence in the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Sir Mark Rowley. It follows the publication of a report by Baroness Casey that concluded the force is institutionally racist, misogynistic and homophobic. Mike Barton was in charge of the Durham Constabulary when it was named England's best police force. He says nothing should go unchallenged. I uh, employed a, a local professor. Uh, I used to sometimes chew my fingers when... I read what she'd said about what we were doing, but it was the best thing that could happen to me because I then had to accept that that's what she said uh, women victims felt like. So I would urge Sir Mark to, to listen to what's being said uh, and to really work out. And China's President Xi Jinping says his country's impartial over the war in Ukraine after holding talks with his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin. On the second day of his three-day state visit to Moscow, President Xi presented a peace plan, but Putin's claimed the West has no interest in an end to the fighting. In the weather, rain and strong winds moving east this evening. That'll clear tomorrow everywhere except the far north. Sunny spells and showers will follow. And our top sports story this hour, a thousand people who fled Ukraine and settled in the UK will receive free tickets for their country's Euro 2024 qualifier against England at Wembley on Sunday. We'll have more on that story and the rest of your sports news in half an hour. Across the UK, on DAB Digital Radio, on the free Times Radio app and via your smart speaker, this is Times Radio. You are listening to Times Radio with Asma Mir. We have heard from all the candidates for the SNP leadership and who want to become uh, First Minister of Scotland for the final time and we will find out who will be Scotland's new First Minister on Monday afternoon. It's a pretty lively audience here as you can uh, still hear. We're going to see what our audience made of what Ash Regan, Hamza Youssef and Kate Forbes had to say tonight. We're also going to hear from our panel of political experts in a moment, but we also want to hear from you. As always, if you want to get involved, you can email us. The address is studio at times.radio, or you can comment on our YouTube page. Hopefully you watch the whole debate on there or on Twitter. The hashtag on Twitter is Times SNP. That's Times SNP. So uh, Times Radio's Aisha Hazarika, uh, Kieran Andrews and John Boothman from The Times Scotland and Shona Craven from The National are all here. Thank you so much for that. Is it just me or is it quite hot in here? It's just yes. me. It's just me, isn't it? It's it is quite hot. Um, we're going to start with your thirty-second assessment of what we just heard. Aisha, you're next to me. Go for it. Well, I think what's interesting is that the sort of you know the biggest row of the night did seem to be over the issue about the GRR and and, and trans rights and the the question about sex education. And I think what's interesting about that is very much like Nicola Sturgeon's legacy and the thing she really prides herself on was the SNB being quite a progressive party but you see there, there's a lot of division on that and it's going to be really interesting to see how whoever wins does try and heal the party on that and of course the other big un unanswered question is there's still no route through a clear path a clear strategy 
through to independence. I mean, you have Ash Regan with a bit of a plan there, but it was interesting seeing kind of Kate Forbes and Hamza Yusuf being a bit more humble and a bit more honest about the fact that there is no easy way through. John Boothman, what did you think? I was worried tonight was going to be really tame. I happened to be the viewer, I think, that's watched all, what, 17 of these debates. And actually, there's been some really heated ones. It was a really high-quality debate. I thought it was mature. I thought all three actually performed probably marginally better than they performed before. It was really interesting to see the differences between them that, as I think you managed to bring out, over taxation, over independence, particularly over that gender reform uh, issue. And I think, you know, you can see that all of those issues are actually reflective of the divisions that the, there are around Scotland on each of them. And, you know, I don't think any of them was particularly convincing, to be honest about how you can actually bring people together around about them. Mm. Shona, what do you think? Well, I, I actually thought that the conversation on taxation was quite interesting. It brought out more of the differences than I've heard before. Um, uh, Kate Forbes was putting her position pretty strongly. Um, I was surprised actually the UK budget didn't come in at all. Sometimes it feels like we're operating in, in a different zone. Um, and it was very telling, you know, the, the sheer level of you know, booing and, and jeering when the, the gender reform topic comes up. But I think it's really important to remember it was a majority in the Scottish Parliament. That doesn't, it, it, this isn't an SNP issue, but the very fact that at an event like this where you're talking about all sorts of important things, mm. including taxation, including the NHS, yeah. that's the a taxes. topic that gets everyone going and that shows that the Scottish Parliament as a whole mishandled the entire policy process there. Whatever you think of the outcome, it was mishandled, and that's reflected in this room tonight. Mm. Um, Kieran Andrews, was there anything that stood out for you? Anything that surprised you? Anything that you learned? Well, I think one of the reasons why it was such a why it was such a high quality debate tonight was because you could tell we're at the end of the process, and I don't mean that because they're just knackered or can't be bothered shouting at each other, but it's because all of the candidates have realised that in a few days' time, they're going to have to come back together and pretend to be pals again. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and that meant that we got a much more instructive, enlightening and constructive debate. But one of the most striking things, I thought, was Kate Forbes and Hamza Youssef effectively trashing the current Scottish Government's approach to independence. Both of them said, Kate Forbes said explicitly, then, then Hamza Youssef said, I agree with pretty much everything Kate said, that the Scottish Government has not made the case for independence. Now, this is an SNP administration, a First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, who has been a life goal to achieve independence. And for that to be the withering assessment of two of your most senior cabinet ministers, that was really striking. Absolutely. Let's hear from Andrew, who's uh, in the audience, who can, who can tell us what he made um, of the uh, debate. I'm just going to hand over this very snazzy Times Radio microphone. Uh, remember, by the way, if you want to get in touch with us and email in a comment, uh, studio at times.radio is uh, the email address. Comment on our YouTube page. Twitter, the hashtag is TimesSNP. Right, Andrew. Yeah, hi. Um, on the GRR issue, which, which I think is probably responsible for losing the SNP a lot of votes, there are two, two outstanding questions. One is the one that was raised by Hilary Benn in, par in the parliamentary debate, and Alistair Jack was unable to answer it. Why is the GRR bill going to affect the Equalities Act when the existing legislation does not? And the second one is that the Section 35 says that a measure has to amend or modify an existing measure, i.e. the Equalities Act, as well as having an effect on it, and evidently this does not. So I don't understand why two of the candidates think that they would lose a, a legal challenge. I don't think they would. Okay. Go, show now. So the, the problem that the UK government has is that the, the process of self-ID, which is embedded within the GRR, that fundamentally changes the cohort of people who have a gender recognition certificate. It changes the number. It's predicted to, in to increase it tenfold. But it also changes who those people are, because there aren't people who have obtained a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, and they aren't people who've uh, gone before a panel. When I say gone before, I, I don't believe it's physically go before a panel. It's gone through a process. I mean, you're shaking your heads, but I'm just giving you the facts. It's all in the public domain. So that's the argument. And, and I'm actually quite unsure what Kate Forbes thinks can be changed in the bill to make it not change the cohort, 
not dramatically expand the number of people since that's kind of its aim. So I'd be really interested to know what her solution might be because part of the problem here is when people talk about prisons and then people call out it's nothing to do with prisons. The principle of self-ID has been embedded in many aspects of our society deliberately by the people who wanted to get as far as the GRR bill. It's just that now people are coming to realise how embedded this is, that there are men in women's prisons. People didn't know that. I've been writing about this for five years. I was well aware of that. Mm. But a lot of people didn't know, and it's come to people's attention, and people are turning around and saying, I don't think I voted for this, because they didn't. To do with the GRR. Well, I've just explained. <laughs> it's self-ID. The GRR is the culmination of, no. a, of a stealth process of, GR, of self-ID. It's self-identification. No, it's not. Yes, it is. It's not. It is. Nobody tells somebody that they want to have a different gender. They decide, and then they go and tell two doctors that's what they want, and the two doctors make a report saying this is what this person wants. Like, that's how it works. OK, OK. Uh, Andrew, I understand that you're exercised by this, but let's, let's, try, let's try to keep this as, as polite and friendly as we possibly can. Aisha. Well, as somebody who helped draft the 2010 Equality Act when I worked for Harriet Harman, it's all about balancing rights, and, and this is a difficult issue. And what we tried to achieve in the Equality Act was to make sure that people, transgender people were not discriminated against, but we did put in a provision to allow adjustments to be made to protect single sex spaces. And that is something which actually has been operating. If you speak to a lot of women's refuges and things like that, that does operate on quite a practical level on, on the ground. What is now going to be explored is whether the GRR, and there was another case which was looking at the, you know, the effect that a gender recognition certificate would have on the Equality Act. So that all needs to be tested. But as somebody who was involved in this legislation on equalities, I just have this plea to make to everybody, and I make it to everybody in this room, and I know tensions are high. There has got to be a middle way through this. We have got to be at a point in society where we can protect women and girls from violence, which is incredibly important. And we know that some people will always take the mick and, and, and try and exploit loopholes. But we also are a progressive, civilised society, and we also do want to try and make life better for men. And I think those two things can exist in the same space. I think we've all got to find a way of having better conversations. It would be terrible if this whole, you know, leadership contest and this, you know, great party in the SNP is an incredibly important political force in Scotland. It would be a shame if this one issue, a bit like in America, became like these kind of, you know, torch-like culture wars and just ripped the whole thing apart. There are really legitimate views on both sides of this debate, and we've got to find a way of, of getting through it because it's not helping either side. Yeah, um, I mean, first of all, I'm aware of the perils of a, a straight guy speaking about this whose you know, rights are not imperiled in any way by it. But the, the point about the, in, the legal advice is the is the interesting one. That, that has to be key to whatever happens next, because if the Scottish Government is going to lose a legal challenge, what's the point in fighting it other than to be performative and dial up the rhetoric and potentially ingrain the, um, the divisions that are, there of co uh, that are there already? Now, of course, if the legal advice says there's a chance, it's a different calculation. But I thought on that point, it was just, again, interesting seeing Hamza Youssef take half a step back from where he has been, you know, throughout uh, every other debate on this, Hamza Yusuf has said, we'll go to the courts no matter what, because that is the principle that the UK government should not, um, you know, should not invoke Section 35 to, to exercise his veto. And tonight he effectively said, well, actually, if the legal advice says we're gubbed, then we're gubbed, yeah. and we need to find another way around it. Again, that's, that was the point of this debate. There was something, the kernel of something constructive, that if you're going to lose, then you've got to start thinking about what you can do that actually makes people's lives better, rather than just standing shouting at the sidelines. Yeah. John Boothman. I, I think the first point I would say about that is that the Scottish Government doesn't have a good record in court against the UK Government, and that's certainly something that Conservative ministers tell me, and I think they're right on that. The second point uh, that I would make relates to the Section 35 order as well. We've heard throughout this campaign the charge that 
this is about undermining devolution and there's going to be lots more of this. The fact of the matter is in Section 35, this is the first in 24 years where this particular section has been used. Now, I often have to ask myself when I see legislation sometimes poorly drafted in the Scottish Parliament, um, is there not somebody who says that you might be open to challenge Thanks to something like a Section 25, how did they know, know that? Because it came right out of the blue. The other point that's worth making on the Section 35, as I understand it, and I ain't no lawyer, uh, is there are two tests. There's a legal test about the substance, whether or not the passing of le this legislation itself has adverse consequences for other parts of the UK. But the second one is a really strange thing. It has to assess whether the Secretary of State, in issuing that Section 35 order, acted in a reasonable way. Now, one Conservative said to me, somewhat jokingly, but whole in earnest, that they would have to prove that the Secretary of State was criminally insane when he considered this in order to win. So I think there is a huge problem with the Scottish Government and the legal advice, and I reckon that Kieran is right. That's the first time I've seen Humza back off that issue in that way. Well, I mean, to be fair, it was the right question to ask to get that response, but also he didn't mention what he has suggested is his plan to, to demand that Section 35 be repealed. I think you could definitely argue that this came out of the blue and that is a, a poor show from the UK government. If they were going to have these problems, were they not paying any attention before? I think there could have been a more constructive way for them to raise their concerns. I think the SNP have to be careful for what they wish for. You don't often hear the SNP saying they want to reopen the Scotland Act. Okay, um, we're going to listen back to a few clips from the debate in a minute, but here's an email that we've had in from KJ. I think it was completely inappropriate for John Nicholson to accuse Kate Forbes of being a sex-obsessed religious fanatic when she is a new young mother. It makes me question his ethics. SNP MPs in Westminster have been attacking Forbes non-stop, and I'm concerned that if she does get elected, the division between Westminster SNP politicians and Holyrood SNP politicians becomes even bigger. Um, what do we think about, we will talk about all the candidates, but should we just focus on Kate Forbes um, for, for a second, Aisha, because um, perhaps she's had the most interesting leadership contest in a way, because it started off with a bang, didn't it? It certainly did. Um, it was all a bit Tim Farron at the beginning, <laughs> basically, which is not really a model you want to kind of uh, sort of... But she um, told the truth, didn't she? That's the thing, she told she, the truth. She did tell the truth, but I think... Um, I think for a lot of um, people, and particularly younger people, they were quite shocked at that because the SNP has very much pitched itself to the public, particularly a lot of younger people who are not maybe members, but they're a big part of the movement. They're a big part of the vibrancy of the SNP, particularly people from the cultural and creative sectors in, in Scotland and sort of civic Scotland. That's actually been one of the great, I think, successes of the Nicola Sturgeon era. It wasn't just about here are our members. It was that broad political movement and it was under quite a progressive mm. banner. So I think that is the reason why people mm. were quite shocked. And also, I think because the trans issue is very live at the moment because we're in kind of new territory. It's quite a new thing. The idea of sort of revisiting the idea of being gay, is that a sin and is gay marriage a sin? That feels like you're going back decades. We've all just watched it. We've all just bawled our eyes out watching It's a Sin. So it just feels like, wow, that's going back. You know, to start, you know, contesting those issues are, are, are quite a big deal. But I think she is the candidate that's actually been the most interesting because despite that very, very difficult start, I would say she's actually, I think, the kind of strongest performer. I think she's the most fluent out of all the, 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 the candidates. But I think if she does win, it is going to be quite a difficult issue for her because I think she will... One of the, the couple of things I noted about what she said, some of her answers do remind you of... Uh, she could appeal to a lot of Conservative voters, you know, let's not raise taxes, let's expand the tax base. That's actually quite a popular kind of Conservative um, argument. Kind of the word, the phrase tartan Tory kind of came back in some way. So in some way, she could be very attractive to some of these kind of older no voters but will she bring with her those younger yes voters that have been very important to the success and the electoral success of the ballot box of the SNP? John Boothman, what did you think of uh, what do you think of Kate Forbes and her her um, performance so far? 
I think the thing that's really, really, really interesting is how she's confounded the people in the rival camp. I think they thought after the start she had, she should, she should have been finished. I think they thought with the great weight of the establishment, all of, really, most of the SNP parliamentary parties in both Westminster and Holyrood and John Swinney, I mean, they threw everything at her but the kitchen sink. And here we are in the last week. Um, I, I don't know whether she'll win or not, right? But I have to say that uh, over the course of the weekend, because of all these internal troubles in the, the SNP, that if anybody's got any momentum, it's probably her rather than Humza. And it's certainly the case that the Humza camp is much, much, much more nervous than the Forbes camp. Um, the way I characterise it is that there's been a straight line from the beginning right along in terms of her performance at a pretty high level. And when I watched tonight, I thought Humza was very good tonight, but he's kind of gone up and down like a yo-yo. Um, I don't know whether I'm going to see it's like the French rugby team, the good Humza or the bad Humza. Um, and I t tonight, I think you saw a bit of the good Humza. So, yeah, I, I, absolutely fascinating. Um, the other point that I think was, is worth making is that if she doesn't win, what are they going to do about her? Would they rather have her outside, I won't use the term, right? Or would they rather have her inside doing it out? Okay. You know when you asked um, if they'd have each other in, yeah. in, the, ca in the cabinet, um, it felt at that point like Kate w had almost won. You know, the, the, the sort of body she was basically saying in terms of, you're not getting health, <laughs> I'm moving you some, somewhere else. And I, th I think her confidence has really grown as well. Her body language is very confident. Yeah, Shauna Craven, what do you think? I think perhaps... Uh, Hamza Yusuf would have Kate Forbes round the table, but not in a comfy chair. Um, maybe, maybe we'll need to look a bit further into the future. Um, it's interesting when thinking about Hamza Yusuf's camp sort of throwing everything but the kitchen sink, especially in relation to what y you were saying, Aisha, about um, the social issues, because we started off bizarrely with this question about gay marriage. And I actually went to England the day that Nicola Sturgeon resigned, brilliant timing, and I was trying to explain how this leadership contest was likely to shape up to people from England, Canada, Dominican Republic. And I said, Kate Forbes was very religious. Religious. I said she'll be asked a lot of these questions and, and I think she'll just say I'm, I'm not getting into hypotheticals and then I came back to Scotland I was like so much for being a political commentator I said she's been very honest but certainly from the readership of the national my paper who write letters who tend to be among the older uh, members of the SNP and, and non-members, really admire that honesty, not because they're all old dinosaurs who don't believe in gay marriage or progressive social values but because they believe her when she says she will not bring that into how she would be a first minister. So I think that was kind of done to death. Um, and a lot of people said, well, she's not suggesting she's going to repeal any of these rights. So then we had to move on mm -hmm. to other more live issues. So abortion, not just buffer zones, but let's throw the kitchen sink at it and say we're going to decriminalise abortion, which... As a feminist, of course, we'd love to see. It's a very legally complex thing to do. And it's a debate that I'm sure a lot of anti-abortion people would love to have yeah. because they want to make a moral argument, not a legal argument. There's also the discussion around conversion therapy and attempts to, to trip Kate Forbes up on yeah. that. But if we've learned anything from GRR, it's that these are not as easy and straightforward topics as you think, and that those two things are linked because one person's trans conversion therapy is another person's homophobia. Like, the two things are very linked. There are, there are grave concerns. There's been a book out about it in the last few weeks that a lot of affirmation of gender non-conforming girls in particular is rooted in homophobia. So you can't get Kate Forbes on that in a, in a, in a, in a very neat way. But there's been a lot of attempts to try and say, oh, well, she's this religious fundamentalist. I must say John Nicholson, it's very rare that I would say a word in his defence, but he didn't say it specifically about her. He was talking in general terms, and I would agree with him that a lot of religious fundamentalists are far too interested in other people's sex life. So that's probably the only time I'll say I agree with John Nicholson. But on this occasion, he wasn't actually yeah. being quite as pointed. And he did say he would be happy to, to serve under, you know, whoever wins. He wasn't really but, but throwing it, a straw. But is it that she's sex obsessed or is it that actually the journalists keep asking her? questions?
decisions based on that? Well, I, I, I do think that a lot of religious people are unhealthily preoccupied with what other people do. But yes, I also think a lot of political journalists were, were so fascinated by this, this character who, of course, they knew, you know, her religious views. But the fact that she was being elevated so quickly, yeah. um, it, it was understandable that the questions were asked. But I think we've heard, as she says, she's answered them enough now. Oh, absolutely. We're going to hear clips in a second very quickly, Kieran, on the, the phenomenon or not of Kate Forbes. Yeah, I think there's two quick points on that. One is, in terms of how she has handled the campaign, once you've crashed the plane on takeoff, there's only one way you can really go. <laughs> and that has, that has lifted a lot of the pressure from... Well, you know, <laughs> maybe in an air ambulance. Um, but you, you can... Uh, it's taken a lot of the pressure off Kate Forbes in a way that Hamza Youssef has had the pressure of being the front runner the entire campaign. And everyone was expecting Hamza Youssef to make a big error at some point, and he hasn't done that. You should give him credit for that. But I think one of the reasons that Kate Forbes has been able to be so relaxed is because there's no pressure. Everyone thought she was doomed from day one. But secondly, just come back to the, the point that came in from the, the viewer about a division between the Westminster groups and uh, sorry, the SNP groups and Westminster and Holyrood. That's not Kate Forbes' biggest problem. It's the fact that most of the parliamentarians at Holyrood don't support her. Will she be able to form a cabinet? Will that cabinet be loyal? What happens then? That is the issue about uniting the SNP. OK, we're going to um, try and uh, just listen uh, back to some clips uh, now. Uh, let's listen back to a bit of the debate so we can just remind ourselves of what was said because uh, there was a lot said. Uh, one of our audience members, Jane Griffiths, asked the candidates about how to, de how to heal divisions within Scottish society. Now, Ash Regan needed a bit of time to think about it and that is that's her right. Hamza Yusuf told us what he thought his priority was. But what we have to do from day one is make sure that whoever the next First Minister is, whether you voted yes or whether you voted no, whether you vote at all, you have to be able to look at your First Minister and believe that they govern in the interests of all of Scotland. And that's something I would want to set the tone for from day one. Now, Ash Regan told us the reasons that she thinks we are so divided. So the only path to independence... I think we are suffering a lot at the moment from cancel culture, and I think everyone understands what I mean by that. And I'm not a fan of that. I really, uh, you know, obviously as being someone that would probably be labelled as gender critical. Um, and even, and I think this is really important, even be able to cause offence. I think this idea that, you know, you can't offend people, um, I don't think that's right. I think you have to be able to cause offence. And uh, Kate Forbes, who we heard a little bit of there, believes we are less able to communicate with one another. I think we have lost the ability to disagree respectfully. It used to be, uh, you know, it used to be a time where you and I may have differing views on something, but we didn't dislike one another as a result of that. We were able to exchange views. And one of the points I've been at pains to make throughout my campaign is that the only path, for example, to one of my goals, which is independence, the only path to that is through persuading those who are not yet persuaded of the merits of independence. And the only way to persuade is to have an audience. The only way to have an audience is through respectful dialogue. The only way for respectful dialogue is if there is a respect of our, our mutual differences. And I think that's been lost across every single divide or disagreement. Now, I mean, this is not just a, a, a Scottish problem, is it? I mean, you, you look at the debate around Brexit and it was incredibly polarised. Cancel culture pretty much every week is incredibly uh, polarised. Uh, the issue of gender, incredibly po polarised as well. Is it idealistic for the candidates to say, I can fix this, I can heal the divisions within Scottish society? How, how would they do it, Aisha? It is very um, difficult and I think actually... Uh, I think uh, I would argue and might get a lot of like pushback against this. I think we've always had a lot of division in society, but I think that was turbocharged. I actually think at the first Scottish um, independence referendum, partly because that was the first big, we hadn't had a big referendum for a long, long time. Very, very divisive and it collided with social media as well. So I think quite a lot of seeds um, of division in, in our kind of discourse were sort of, you know, sown in that, in that referendum campaign. So I was kind of, I mean, Ash, I thought it was interesting, Ash Reagan didn't even recognise the premise of the question at the beginning and then sort of just went straight to sort of cancel culture and, and Brexit and Farage, even though I thought she sounded quite Faragey herself sort of talking about, about things. Um, I thought Kate Forbes was really 
quite honest about kind of saying that actually I am going to address the sort of elephant in the room, which is the independence debate, and you know, m making the argument about reaching out to no voters is incredibly um, important. I think Hamza, Yusuf, and Hart are kind of in that sort of territory, but we shouldn't kid ourselves. This issue of independence is a hugely divisive issue. We all know from our experiences back in 2014, families were divided, workplaces were, were divided, you know, friendships came un under strain. And we're all quite frightened about the prospect of that sort of happening again. So it will not be an easy thing um, to do, but I think it does come, it has to come from the top, it does have to come from the leadership. And they have to acknowledge that division, if they do want to really, really push the independence thing, division will be part of that. Um, Shauna Craven, do you agree with Aisha's uh, premise that a, a lot of the origin of um, the divisions within Scottish society came from the collision of social media and the last referendum? And I think that a lot of people have selective memories when it comes to the last referendum. I have a very, very vivid memory <coughs> of walking in Glasgow past a bus stop and I heard two blokes saying blah, 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 fiscal framework as I walked past and I just thought, this is wild. You know, people just in their normal lives, I don't know who they were, maybe they were spads or something, but I don't think they were. Just ordinary people talking about all sorts of aspects of the society they wanted to live in. Um, and thinking, you know, what kind of country do we want to live in? And being allowed to have those thoughts, not restricted by the fact that, oh, well, we don't control immigration. Oh, well, we don't have the money for that. Oh, well, people would leave if we did this or that. It was, for a lot of people, very, very liberating. Um, and so I think this idea, yeah, people disagreed. Um, maybe people have still fallen out about it. Maybe there are still tensions. But I don't think you can make a monumental change or discuss a monumental change without people disagreeing. <laughs> and yes, you know, people talk about cybernats and, and all the rest of it. But I do think that to me, the GRR stuff has been absolutely 10 times worse. And I don't recall uh, during the independence campaign people being smeared in the same way. You know, people call each other, you know, <coughs> bleeding heart idealistic liberals. People say you're a Tory or you, you, you know, don't mind being under the thumb of Westminster. But the idea of people just being completely delegitimised is a new thing. And I think that if it hadn't been GR, maybe it would have been something else. This idea that people are mm. bad people because they hold the wrong opinion, even with the deposit return scheme, obviously that's a less hot button issue. Mm. But I think because of this heightened thing, you have heard people get really quite nasty at other people in the parliament over what are technicalities. Nobody disagrees that this is a good idea. But you do hear this quite strong language, okay. like, oh, if you don't like the DRS, is that because you love litter? And it's like, <laughs> calm down, everyone. Yeah. And okay. I think that things have moved on since the referendum in, in a negative way. But I think the debates can be had again okay. in a civilised way. Right, we've got another 25 minutes to go. Uh, we're going to break for the news now. Um, you're listening to the Times Radio SNP debate with Asma May. And listen, we have been running a poll on our YouTube channel who won tonight? And there is a runaway winner. And I'll let you know who, the, who that is in a few minutes. Let's get the headlines now on Times Radio with Eleanor Sherwood. Across the UK, on DAB, online and on your smart speaker, this is Times Radio. Asma, thank you. Good evening. The three candidates who could be the next leader of the Scottish National Party have just held their final debate on Times Radio. It came just hours after Nicola Sturgeon chaired her final cabinet meeting. Kate Forbes, Hamza Youssef and Ash Regan clashed over issues such as tax and the gender recognition reform bill. On that, Ash Regan accused the Scottish Government of failing to listen to people who were critical of the law, while Hamza Youssef said he'd await legal advice. Kate Forbes said she'd do the same but she supports reforming the law to make it easier for trans people to change their gender. It does stigmatise the trans community, and I think that we do need to make it less onerous. But we also need to take women and girls with us. So we need to ensure that we have the confidence of women and girls when it comes to single-sex spaces and don't uh, stigmatise the trans community further. And I think that once I've sought legal advice on the way forward, we can, in Parliament, we can find a way forward. Boris Johnson says he's looking forward to facing the Privileges Committee tomorrow. It's over claims the former Prime Minister misled MPs over Partygate. He's admitted doing so, but accidentally. Research suggests any type of hormonal contraceptive, including the mini pill, could increase the risk of women getting breast cancer. Scientists put the chances at between 20 and 30% higher than those not taking any. 
and a man's been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after another man was set on fire walking home from a mosque last night. Anti-terror police are investigating in Birmingham. The victim suffered facial burns when his jacket was set alight. In the weather, rain and strong winds moving east this evening. That will clear tomorrow everywhere except the far north. Sunny spells and showers will follow. Craig Wakeling has your sport. England Rugby Union captain Sarah Hunter says retiring in her home city feels right. She'll step away from the sport after Saturday's Women's Six Nations opener against Scotland in Newcastle. Hunter won the World Cup in 2014 and is rugby's most capped female player. Speaking to Times Radio, she admitted that carrying on would be difficult after the World Cup last year. I knew I wasn't going to go to the next World Cup in 2025, so it was going to happen sometime between between then and, and 2025, but... I, I I just wasn't sure um, what I wanted to do. Like when I first came back, probably not in the greatest headspace after obviously losing the World Cup, like body was a bit broken. And I like went from, nah, I'm done. I'm retiring right now to, oh, I'm not sure if I want to. Um, and went back and forth for quite a while. Ospreys say Wales forward Jack Morgan and Scott Baldwin are likely to miss the rest of the season after picking up injuries during Rugby Union Six Nations. Morgan faces an ankle operation this week while Baldwin has undergone surgery on a pectoral problem. Ospreys still have three matches in the United Rugby Championship to play as well as a last 16 clash with Saracens in the Champions Cup. Now, the England international, Phil Foden, has revealed that his side has been told to move on from their World Cup quarterfinal exit last year and concentrate on qualifying for the Euros next year. The three Lions take on Italy tomorrow evening in Naples and then host the Ukraine on Sunday at Wembley. Foden says the message from Gareth Southgate has been clear. Put the World Cup behind us because that's gone now and we have to prepare and try and qualify for another major tournament, so... Yeah, that's that's what he touched on, and yeah, that's that's our aim, you know, to win these next games and try and try and put us in a good situation. An 18-year-old Brighton striker, Evan Ferguson, will start for the Republic of Ireland for the first time in tomorrow's friendly against Latvia. He scored seven times for Roberto De Zebri's side this season, including twice in Sunday's FA Cup quarter-final win against Grimsby. These stories and more head over to the Times website and app. This is Times Radio. Wake up to a brighter breakfast. Times Radio Breakfast, seven days a week from 6am. This is Times Radio. Right, welcome back to Edinburgh, to Times uh, Radio's and the Times Scotland's SNP debate. We heard earlier on from all three candidates vying to be uh, the next leader of the SNP, the next First Minister of Scotland. We heard from Ash Regan, from Hamza Youssef and Kate Forbes. Now we're analysing... Uh, some of what they said with Times Radio's Aisha Hazarika, with Kieran Andrews and John Boothman from the Times Scotland and Shona Craven from The National. And you've been getting in touch as well. Remember, you can email us on studio at times.radio. You can comment on our YouTube page or on Twitter using the hashtag TimesSNP. Now, before the news, I did tell you all that we have uh, been running a poll and I promised to let you know how that poll it's just on our YouTube channel. It's not necessarily the most scientifically accurate thing, but I'm sure you'd like to know anyway. Um, Hamza Youssef has got 14%. Ash Regan is on 9%. And Kate Forbes is the clear winner with Times Radio YouTube watchers. She is on 77%. <laughs> Right, now we've discussed Kate Forbes already. Let's talk about Hamza Youssef, shall we, just very quickly. Kieran Andrews, I was very struck that earlier on you said that we should give Hamza Youssef credit for not slipping up. That's a low bar, isn't it? <laughs> well, it, it's the pressure of being the front runner. You know, it, it is difficult. Hamza Youssef was out and he is quite clearly the SNP establishment's favourite. He has the backing of the vast majority of parliamentarians, as John said earlier on. John Swinney, the Deputy First Minister, a man who is incredibly popular across the party, has come out to back him. He couldn't get much more in the way of general support. But he also has, as Kate Forbes pointed out quite acerbically on the first televised debate, it's quite a lot of baggage as well from his, his ministerial record. Mm. And that could have tripped him up as he went along. You know, he's, he's had to take a lot in terms of um, criticism of his record, question marks about his honesty and integrity over um, turning up for, for various votes or not. And he has 
withstood all of that and he hasn't dropped the ball and he has remained, as John said, he's been up and down in terms of some of his performances, but he has come through at the end and still looks like the favourite. And that, I know it sounds like a low bar, but that's not actually an easy thing to do. And Hamza Yusuf has, has achieved it. Mm. John Boothman, what do you make of Hamza Yusuf's performance throughout the leadership contest? Well, as I've said already, it's a bit up and down. I think the difficulty that Hamza has, if you look at the great sweep of history, the SNP have had four leaders in 40 years. Uh, Gordon Wilson, Alex Salmond, John Swinney for very, very, very briefly, and uh, Nicholas Sturgeon, of course. Um, I have to say, and I wrote about this a few weeks ago, um, and I picked this up from people in Hoomza's camp, uh, they're going to have a very, very difficult general election next year. And if Hoomza wins, uh, Kate Forbes, if she won, would have different pl- problems, I've suggested. If Hoomza wins, I wonder whether he might be the shortest-lived SNP leader um, for a while. Because the other point that I think is worth making is that Really, if you look across the parliament, both parliaments, they are not going to make the same mistake that Nicola Sturgeon made, which is not have some kind of succession plan and certainly not have an orderly transition. So if we get to next year and the possibility is that Labour, for example, might have a minority government or a majority government, and more particularly if the SNP go backwards in Scotland, I'll be interested to see whether Humza survives. Okay. Um, on the subject of um, Hamza Yusuf, Frank Lee Bryan has commented on our YouTube page, I've watched most of these debates, and most of the ad hominem attacks come from Hamza, along with bucket loads of patronisation and scorn. Aisha, is that fair? Well, I mean, this guy's obviously not a Hamza uh, Yusuf um, supporter. I mean, look, these leadership debates, leadership debates are always bruising. You, the whole point of them is you've got to go on the attack. You don't turn up at a leadership debate to sort of praise your rivals. You, you answer a question, you use that answer to pivot to an attack that happens on a national level when you're kind of pitching for the top job as prime minister. What's much more difficult when it's uh, an internal leadership contest is, of course, you're effect- effectively trashing your collective record because it's sort of, you know, yellow on, on, on yellow. I actually thought he was quite kind of gracious on some of the attacks. I feel that what we've kind of seen is a sort of a bit of a, whether it's by design or accident, a bit of Ash Regan and uh, Kate Forbes kind of aligning on on quite a lot of things against um, Hamza Yusuf, particularly on sort of a lot of the gender and uh, progressive stuff, which also sort of on the tax question as well. So I thought he, I think he's a bit more gracious, but I think what will be interesting is if he does win, certainly somebody from an ethnic minority background growing up in, you know, Scotland in the 70s and 80s, I never, ever, ever thought it would ever be possible to see a person of colour have a senior position in Scottish politics, let alone be the First Minister. So that will be, if it happens, and I do take John's point, I think he will in some ways be an easier target for the Labour Party. He's probably the sort of preferred, I don't think they say Ash Regan is serious, I think that they're looking at kind of Kate Forbes, Hamza Yusuf, he's probably the easier candidate, but it will, if he does get it, it will be a big moment for Scotland. Uh, and a Labour leader in Scotland from the same Absolutely. background. Absolutely, yes. yeah. And, pr- and a current Prime Minister of, of, of the UK Yeah, I mean, that's, well. a big, that's a big moment for, for the United <laughs> Kingdom. Everything comes in threes, they say. <laughs> um, Shona Craven, what do you think of Hamza Yusuf's performance? I don't think he has been patronising or scornful. Uh, and I think there's been times when Kate Forbes and Hamza Yusuf have maybe been seen to slightly gang up on Ash Regan, especially during some of the, the, the ma- not manufactured, but, you know, when they're, they're given the chance to cross-examine each other. And I think some, sometimes they've sort of exploited some of her lack of experience and lack of knowledge, which, to be fair, she's quite upfront about about that being the case, certainly, as the campaign's gone on. I think that it, there is a challenge for Hamza Yusuf in the fact that he's a man up against two women. He's, he's physically much taller than Kate Forbes, and he knows how it would look if he was to keep interrupting. And I have been noticing that um, it may Maybe what people think is patronising or they don't like is that they see Hamza Yusuf say, often to Kate Forbes, I've not interrupted you, so you shouldn't interrupt me. Well, if you don't like that, then all that does is draw attention to the fact that he isn't actually interrupting them. He, he has the experience. He probably has. I'm sure I've seen him in Parliament b- sort of being a bit hot-headed. I feel like I've seen that throughout his political career, but obviously he has... <laughs> 
a lot of support and a lot of people helping him. And I've not seen that. I think tonight was 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 very assured. I think he's become even more confident. Um, and I don't think he is being patronising. And I think the alternative would be that he would be seeming domineering or bullying, which would be much worse. OK, we'll talk about Ash Regan as well. We've got about... Well, 13 more minutes so we've got a lot to cram in we're going to talk a little bit about gender and we're going to talk about independence um so obviously heated debate over the gender recognition bill you've heard it coming from our audience but also from the candidates who argued um about this during the debate let's hear um Hamza Youssef I asked him if he regretted not supporting an amendment that would keep rapists out of jail and this is what he said of course, in the Isla Bryson case, that was a mistake. Well, yeah. of course it was a mistake. Of, of course it was a mistake, and of course it has nothing to do with GRR because GRR is not in force. Uh, no, you can shout. Okay. You can it's shout all you want, it's but the bill. Okay, okay, okay. okay. It's a bill, policy based on self ID. Okay. The, ba- okay. the bill is not even in force, so anybody to shout and suggest that but has to do with GRR. In Scotland. I'm okay, afraid let's, let's running ahead of the okay, law. Okay, let's hum- let It's simply not correct. And I also asked the candidates if they agreed with J.K. Rowling that Nicola Sturgeon was a destroyer of women's rights. And I put that question to Kate Forbes first. For me, I think that J.K. Rowling has been subject to far too much abuse for raising very legitimate concerns. Um, And I think you can also think that Nicola Sturgeon has been pioneering when it comes to to women and girls. Okay, Hamza Youssef. I'll give you a pretty binary answer. No, I don't think Nicola Sturgeon is a destroyer of women's rights at all. Quite the opposite. I think she has spent most of her career, her political career, trying to advance the rights of women. To anybody suggest that she's been a destroyer of women's rights, I'm afraid, is something I just take exception to. So that's JK Rowling then, that you take exception Indeed. to? Indeed. Okay. Um, Ash Regan. I think uh, JK Rowling has been very brave in the way that she's... Um, you know, advocated for this issue at a time, like we were talking about earlier, at a time a few years ago when hardly anyone dared to speak up on this issue because they were fearing for their livelihoods. You know, it was uh, such a toxic debate that you couldn't say anything. I think it's changed a little bit in the last couple of years. So I think she was very brave to do that. And I think people speaking out gave other people confidence to speak out. So I think that was important. Um, I wouldn't phrase it in the way that she has, but I did have serious concerns about the impact that that piece of legislation would have on Um, women's single-sex spaces and exemptions and the ability to uphold them in law and the conflict with the Equality Act. Mm -hmm. And I felt that women, you know, felt that they were going to be less safe, protected and have less dignity as a result of that. And obviously I ultimately resigned from the government over this issue because I felt I could not vote in good conscience for that piece of legislation. Let's talk about uh, gender recognition and also talk a bit about Ash Regan as well. Aisha Hazarika, that was, you know, that's obviously one of her points of, of difference. You know, she talked there about, you know, resigning um, from the government um, ov- over that particular issue. Where does that leave her, do you think, in a post Nicola Sturgeon SNP? Well, this is her one thing, right? This is the thing that she has defined her career on. She hasn't sort of held massively high office, but she did uh, resign on principle because she was very, very against this. But she has shaken up this campaign. She's put trans rights and she's put this row at the heart of it. But she is a one trick pony. Um, I don't think she has a huge amount to offer on, on anything else. But I think post this contest and it'll be interesting to see how she does and also where her second preferences go will be very very interesting she could may end up being a bit of a king or a, or a queen um, maker um, in in all of this but i think whatever happens post um the election i don't think she'll win i still think she will be an important voice particularly on this gender recognition issue it's not going away but what i thought was interesting about how she's very clear about so you know jk rowling she's being, she's basically saying i'm totally with jk rowling i'm kind of trashing nicola sturgeon on this you know be aware of that and on the um, the coronation she's like i'm doing this march and now everybody's now moving towards actually i think i'm going to get a train down to london um, and and turn up and the... so i feel she's quite an interesting she's a bit of i think a kind of sort of trans fixated sort of female nigel farage a bit i think that's her kind of vibe <laughs> I don't want to explain to me about the Nigel, Far- Nigel no, Farage thing. No, just she's very kind of like, I'm not doing anything with the coronation. I'm very right, much okay. like, you know, this, it, it's in the same way that Nigel Farage is very, very England, England. She's very, very Scotland, Scotland. OK. Um, Shona Craven, uh, what do you think um, Ash Regan has gained or not from this leadership uh, contest? It's a really, really good question. I don't know what's next for Ash Regan. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm not sure what she wants to get out of this. I think a lot of people maybe didn't think she would still be in the contest to the end and saw the transfer of votes sort of occurring before the ballot opened, if you like. So a lot of people who, who knew Ash Regan, who even knew her name, um, because of the GRR stuff, um, th their votes would perhaps logically go to Kate Forbes. Mm -hmm. So the fact that she's still in the contest um, is testament to her stamina. Um, and yes, you could say that she's sort of fixated on this issue, but at the end of the day, she, she did look at the evidence and she looked at the policy and she listened to her constituents who were raising concerns. And she didn't ask to be made a, a poster girl for a GRR opposition. She, she was in the government and she couldn't mm. vote. And so you could ask why the vote was whipped. Um, and I must remind everyone that there was parliamentarians from all the parties who supported it. Um, so it, the idea that Nicola Sturgeon, of course she's the First Minister, but this isn't some pet project by Nicola Sturgeon that no one else wanted. It was supported mm -hmm. across the Parliament. OK. Um, have we put uh, an end to any speculation about Alex Salmond pushing Ash Regan, do you think, Kieran? No, um, especially not from Ash Regan's answer. Um, <laughs> <coughs> but, 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 I mean, I, thi I think there's, there's... She said that she'd, she'd phoned lots of people including Alex Salmon. I think that's... Yes, and spoken about an independence convention and then mentioned how much he had praised her um, and her ideas for independence and how, how much he backs her. Um, that didn't know each other. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, listen, that's... I think one of the interesting things about this will be to see exactly how much support Ash Regan gets in the SNP, to see... We don't know a lot about the membership of the SNP, so finding out what the base level of support for Ash Regan and her views, uh, which are very similar to the policies that have been put forward by Alex Salmond and his uh, ALPA party, we'll find out how much of a constituency there is f for that in the SNP. And that, it may or may not be something to be sniffed at, mm. but it will be something that will inform where the SNP goes with, with a new leader. Because if it's sizable, if it's even anything north of 10%, that's not something you can just turn away and say is insignificant. Mm. So, you know, what Ash Regan's support is, she has, whatever you think of her, and she's been ridiculed a lot, um, sometimes fairly, sometimes not, but what she has done is set a lot of the, you know, she's set the direction for a lot of the campaign. The the membership figures that came out over the weekend, forced uh, came out last week, forced Peter Murrow out over the weekend. Mm. She set the running on that. You know, she, she has had more influence than she's been given credit for because she said some, frankly, ridiculous things at the same time. OK, well, we've got uh, about five minutes to go. So, uh, John Boothman, very quickly on Ash Regan. I think she's an incredibly brave woman. Uh, when you look at the history of the SNP since devolution, uh, a whole cornerstone of it was built on iron discipline. And actually for... Uh, someone and the other eight people alongside her who actually rebelled against that GRR stuff, right? And it's the first really major uh, rebellion in that history of the SNP in government as well is absolutely astonishing. The first person to resign on an issue of principle. Mm. So she might be the weakest candidate. She might come third, but do you know what? She's pretty brave and deserves some praise for that. OK, uh, let's finish on independence. On the question of independence, Hamza Youssef and Kate Forbes both had... Surprisingly critical views of the work that the SNP under Nicola Sturgeon had done in terms of, you know, trying to build a case for and show people the route to independence. Uh, we've touched on this before. Um, what, what, what can the candidates do if they become First Minister to boost support for independence? Shona. Well, I think it, it's unarguable what Hamza Youssef and Kate Forbes say, that they have to govern well. They have to get the party united again, perhaps bring back some of these members that they've lost, um, and then obviously persuade some no voters as well to come over. So you have this difficulty for the SNP members. They may have a personal preference. They may, you know, have a, a personal loyalty, but they can't be naive about the fact Kate Forbes is being asked, you know, will you demand a referendum? And what she didn't say was, I'm not going to demand a referendum that I'm not going to win. Mm. And so I'm going to demand the right to hold one when I see fit, when the polls support us. I was surprised, actually, that they accepted the premise of your question about the 45%. Mm. Ash Regan didn't uh, accept the premise because that's just one poll, which is obviously the standard Sturgeonite answer. So I'm surprised Hamza Yusuf seemed to accept yeah. that support was back down where it was in 2014, which I don't think a lot of polls suggest. Uh, John Boothman? 
One of the things that's fascinating for me about this election campaign is that 12 months ago we were we would all sat in this room and we were being promised, a cast iron promise, that there would be a referendum this October and the SNP would lead us to independence. Now when you talk to the two main rival candidates, they're talking about maybe in five years we might have independence. And I think that's a huge, huge difference for where the SNP have been, where Scotland's been, that actually that, that time frame has shifted. I think the biggest mistake that Nicola Sturgeon made um, throughout her time as First Minister was going to the Supreme Court, where she comprehensively lost. It took away that promise of a referendum sometime soon, just over the horizon. It's sooner than you think. Swept it all away. There's not going to be independence or a referendum okay. until beyond the next Scottish Parliament election, if it happens at all. Right, we're at the end of the programme. I'm going to end with your predictions. Of course I am. Aisha Hazarika, who is going to be First Minister, the next First Minister of Scotland? I think it's going to be Kate Forbes. <laughs> There was a gas. I think it, I think it's going to be Kate. My waters okay. are speaking to me. Okay. <laughs> okay, we can't argue with your waters. Uh, John Boothman might. Whom's are the favourite? But I wouldn't be surprised if she pips them in the end, and those second preferences might be important. Shona. I'm not basing this on your YouTube poll, but I've said consistently a lot of SNP members don't like being told what to do, and I think Kate Forbes. Okay, Kieran. Depends what the SNP members think. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Kieran. Come on, um, Kieran. You can't do that. Well, she, she's, you know, uh, talked about our waters, yeah. and and you're just copping out. What are oh, your well, swimmers telling you? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Listen, I, I'm, I'm trying not to appear like a sex-obsessed zealot here. Um, I, I think that the second preference is will almost certainly come into play in Kate Forbes' win. It's a big ask to get more than fifty percent on the first pass, which is what Hamza needs to do. OK, uh, well, listen, that is uh, the end uh, of the programme. Thank you so much to our audience here in Edinburgh. It's been a long two hours and you've been fantastic. Thank you also to Times Radio's Aisha Hazarika, to the Sunday Times' John Boothman, the National's uh, Shona Craven and the Times' Kieran Andrews. And of course, we will bring you the result on Monday afternoon on Times Radio when we will find out who will be Scotland's next First Minister. Also, thank you to everyone who got in touch via uh, YouTube, people who watched along on YouTube as well, people who emailed us, uh, tweeted us. You can keep uh, that going, of course, that conversation going all night if you want, so we can wake up to it in the morning as, again. The hashtag is uh, Times SNP. But that is it from us here in Edinburgh, and we're going to hand back over to the Times Radio studio in London and to Carol Walker. Many thanks, Asma. A great debate. We'll be reflecting on the highlights later in the programme and, of course, on that scathing report into the Metropolitan Police. That's coming up shortly here on Times Radio.